Welcome to Nick and Dave Deep Dive the Metaverse, a podcast exploring cult classics, subculture, and geek media. I'm Nick. And I'm Dave. And we will be your tour guides for this deep dive of Denis Villeneuve's 2017 hard-boiled techno-noir thriller sequel, Blade Runner 2049. It's hard to believe it's already been five years since this came out, because I remember seeing this in the theater. It was hella good. Actually, no. I saw it on HBO, I think. I don't know. I uh, Maybe both. Maybe both. I saw it, um, I saw it in the theater, in the original run, uh, and I saw it at the Cinerama in, in Seattle, um, which is a... The, they're kind of mid-century theaters okay. from the, you know, the, the epic Panavision, Cinerama, yeah. the epic widescreen era. So they're really big screens, like the kind the, the modern Cineplexes don't have. Okay. And that's like the perfect way to see this movie because it's a big movie. Yeah, this movie's huge. And there are so many landscapes and uh, just really big panning photography mm-hmm. moments. And so I can see that being uh, being really... Really important. Um, yeah. Man, this movie was one that I was really looking forward to. This is the last one in our cyberpunk uh, series. Yeah, which I was very happy that it ended up that way because we didn't quite start with Blade Runner because we got Escape from New York in mm-hmm. there. Yeah. But more or less, the the Blade Runner movies bookend the series, and I think yeah, that's they appropriate. Do. They do. They really... Yeah. It's funny how we've been deep diving this, uh, this genre and or subgenre of science fiction, I guess, uh-huh. um, and I just... I see cyberpunk everywhere now. I'm like, oh, that's cyberpunk. That's uh, cyberpunk. Like, well, it's, it's become a mainstay of science fiction in general. It has, to the point where it's almost like... It's like it uh, seems passe to some people, I think. But then still... I opened Twitter this morning as I as I generally do and look at what's trending. Blade Lu- Blade Runner was literally trending this morning. Oh wow! So it's it's like that. It's do you, do you a, think Blade it, Runner is an eternal thing in cinema. Oh yeah, it's it's amazing. And I mean, do you think it was about uh, anything about the Blade Runner twenty ninety nine that uh, has been uh, greenlit by Amazon? Is that what oh, you're talking about? No, no, it was about it was about. Uh, which that's that's not it's like 55 i think whatever the it, new series uh, i mean i just it, i just did some googling and looking around and it looked like the the amazon one is 50 years after this movie so it should be 2099 oh 2099 yeah, yeah. and and so i misheard you yeah and and so it's like 80 years after the original mm-hmm. movie and um uh denis villeneuve is uh not involved in this one, but we still have we have some Ridley Scott involvement as a producer. So, yeah. yeah, should um, be cool. That was none of the tweets I saw. I saw tweets about this movie, about the original one, huh. um, just just regular um, film Twitter movie geek posts. Yeah, you know, as I've kind of leaned into um, some niche uh, Twitter Twitter spheres like uh-huh. disc golf, movies, podcasts, stuff like that, I really find myself kind of. Uh, insulated against the uh the the shit storm that is twitter <laughs> like people are like twitter's terrible it's like i don't know dude every disc golfer i know and like all these cool movie stars that i follow they yeah. tweet about cool stuff my yeah my feed's not bad i have to kind of go out and seek things that irritate me on twitter you know what's the number it's one? doable but that, yeah. i don't have to you, you know, know what the the number one move is if you want to make your twitter way better is mute um elon musk <laughs> because then you won't see any of the replies to him or oh. retweets arguing against his tweets and stuff and it just makes it makes life a lot better i can see that yeah i can see that um i was gonna say what we were talking about seeing this movie in the theater mm-hmm. this is probably it, i can't think of a single more divisive movie i saw in the theater really yeah where like the the buzz in the audience afterwards was very divided that was great or that was terrible and people wow. and people had strong opinions one way or the other i remember seeing it and um i believe i saw it with carrie uh-huh. and we both liked it right off the bat yeah i w- i walked out thinking wow i have a lot to think about yeah it's, it's, <laughs> it's a think it's a thinker yeah some people don't like thinking and some people don't like those people are on tiktok right now they don't listen to three hour podcasts yeah maybe no but, hate to you tiktokers out there um yeah i don't know 
I don't know what people expect out of out of a movie like this. I'm glad movies like this exist. I wish more people saw them so more of them got made. Because yeah. this was considered financially a failure for Warner Brothers. Which is insane because, I mean, it made like $100 million, which isn't... It needed to make four. Yeah, it's, it's kind of ridiculous when $100 million in profit mm-hmm. isn't sufficient. I mean, come on, that's profit. That's a yeah. lot of money. I know, but it's not... For for a big studio, they want a certain return. Yeah, they they don't consider that a good return on investment. They want four times the investment back, or something like that. Something like that. That's... Yeah, this this movie needed for Warner Brothers to consider it a success. Needed to make for for Billy, and yeah. it's like, it's, I mean, you just can't I, or or four hundred million. That's what yeah, I, mean. I, I mean, meant to say. But yeah, I, I don't like. I don't like that because this movie this movie was absolutely art. Mm-hmm. And then you you see like I don't know, how many remakes of garbage movies do we need and mm-hmm. how many kids movies do we need that are just a live action version of a cartoon yeah. or whatever. It's like, come on, give us good movies. Don't give us that uh just complete dreck. Yeah, and it's weird like I you know, sometimes sometimes those movies are good like for mm-hmm. what for what they are like um, but like I, you know, like I was talking about with the the Metallica song last episode, yeah. and I'll say I've come around on that completely. Okay. I'm no longer cynical about it. But the thing that makes me cynical about it is things like uh, like a Ghostbusters Afterlife, which is a perfectly fine movie that sure. doesn't need to exist. It's just a nostalgia machine. It doesn't have anything new to say. Sure, it's just uh, we could still make Ghostbusters movies. And yeah. and this movie avoided that. It actually adds to the. It says it asks new questions and it adds yeah. to the to the mythos. But that's challenging to the audience. The audience wants to see you know Harrison Ford and and Ryan Gosling running around shooting robots or, or whatever yeah, whatever yeah. whatever it wants. That would have made four hundred million dollars. Probably if this had been. If this had been an action movie and not a neo noir science fiction thriller, yeah, then it probably would have made money. People don't want thrillers anymore, yeah. Uh, which I, I mean, the first Blade Runner was slower than this. Oh, yeah, this it is. It, I mean, this is a much more modernly paced movie, and it's still plotting, yeah, but it just feels more brisk than, than Ridley Scott's it's just Blade Runner. I mean, the thing is, is Both of the movies are slow paced with lots of room to breathe Uh um, and lots of room to just kind of stop and take in a scene Mm -hmm. and, and, and the set design and the costumes, they they linger a lot on these things. And and I think that's a strength. Um, But neither movie, neither movie is trying to be like a, you know, a heart pounding thriller. They're, yeah. They're not, they're, they're not they're, action movies. Yeah. They're trying to make you, they're trying to make you think and they're trying to immerse you. And neither of them were boring at any point. I yeah. never was like, well, when's this going to be over? Yeah. No, I, I, I think the original Blade Runner gets boring. Do you? I, I do. I think it's a little too plotting at, at times. Okay. And I don't, I think this one avoids it. I, I find it easier to stay engaged with this. I think actually it's because I find, K a more sympathetic protagonist than Deckard. Yeah. You know, one thing I like about Deckard in this one is they don't answer whether he's definitively a replicant or not in this movie. Yeah. That's it, great. Um, yeah, they don't answer it. Uh, I was listening to an interview with uh, Denis Villeneuve today where he is talking about how because Ridley Scott and Harrison Ford have such radically different takes on mm-hmm. whether he is or not, um, he didn't want to to he wanted to leave that still ambiguous and that's important yeah i think that really makes it more interesting yeah and that's something i like that's something like i feel like uh like the last jedi does also it's like sure some things some things don't matter some of the things that geeks want to like pick over and say this is you know this means this and blah 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 it actually doesn't matter to the filmmaker or you know to the story that's being told in the new movie yeah. and i'd like I like that kind of, uh, don't worry about that. We're talking about this when filmmakers have that confidence. And I like that when it lets you think about the film in two different ways. Like Mm -hmm. if he's a replicant, then I think blah, blah, blah. If he's not, I think maybe this and that. Yeah. 
it makes it more interesting uh, for the viewer, and it lets the uh, it lets the filmmaker toy with that concept a little more. Yeah, and it's like that's what makes these movies that well after you know their their original runs. Yeah, people are still talking about them on Twitter like enough that it yeah. go, it gets trending and mm-hmm. on a day. And yeah. and I think this movie is definitely worth talking about. I I probably should see it again. Um, with with new eyes i really really like uh i really just kind of felt myself um like mesmerized by the scenery in the movie so gorgeous um yeah so i think i think that's really cool i went and did some additional diving on youtube stuff about the props and the costumes Mm -hmm. and all the stuff and so this is this one's got a lot to chew on but uh let's go ahead and get moving and roll for initiative okay I got a three. I got a two, so you just oh, sneaked man. out a win. Holy crap. I thought that was done. <laughs> okay, so the Game Awards 2022 just happened. That's a bunch of my stuff, too. Oh, man. Well, I'm not doing any awards. I'm only doing previews. Okay. So um, I have a few that I called out that I think are interesting. Okay. There was a bunch that were super hyped that I was like, nah, pass. <laughs> okay. So the ones that I was interested in was Dune Awakening, the MMO from Fun, Fun Con, uh-huh. Funcom. Um, and they are, uh, it's a survival open world sandbox MMO sandbox. Um, <laughs> um, and it looks hella cool. It's going to be available cross platform, PC, PlayStation five, Xbox, etc. Um, they're, it just looks cool. I've played a lot of MMOs. It looks like a lot of fun. I mm-hmm. can definitely see myself being a casual as long as it doesn't have a subscription fee. Okay. Then I probably wouldn't. Next up. I thought uh, there's a there's a game coming out called Hellboy Web of Weird. That looked really cool. Yeah, it looks super cool. It's cell shaded 3D style. It looks uh-huh. like a comic book. It looks just like Mike Mignola's illustrations yeah, animated. Yeah, super rad. It's like an adventure fighter, which isn't my style of game. I figure mm-hmm. it's something you would like. Um, but I just thought it was so stri- striking on the screen that it was mm-hmm. worth uh, bringing up. There's one called Crime Boss uh, Rake City. It's an open world crime game that's with an all star celebrity cast, and it looks kind of like a cooler, updated open world Grand Theft Auto. Hmm. Um, it just looks super rad. I, I want to wait till that comes out, watch some reviews, and then maybe give it a shot. Okay. And then last up, there's a game called Jedi uh, or called Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Uh-huh. It's a follow up to Fallen Order. So I didn't play Fallen Order. And I never play any of these Star Wars games, but I always think I should play that. Yeah, I hear nothing but good stuff about that series. Mm -hmm. They're in canon and expanding the the mythology of that time period. And the games look awesome. Yeah, I should. I really should give that a shot. Yeah, just crank it down to easy because I'm old, <laughs> and uh, just I don't think play you need it, to do that. Play it for the story. Yeah. So those are those are the game upcoming games for the new year that I'm looking forward to. I cannot believe that you didn't mention at Street Fighter Six uh, the preview that they showed, yeah. and that it is now available for pre order. That's coming out um, on June sixth. Uh, available for pre-order now and if you pre-order it uh, you get special costumes for a bunch of the characters i will say like we have a we have roots in in fighting games and mm-hmm. stuff like that but i haven't played in a decade i love street fighter that's that's my that's my heart right there is that series yeah. so um street fighter and tekken i love mm-hmm. both of those they had a preview for tekken too which oh, also nice. looked awesome um but they didn't have a release date on tekken um the other thing was the preview for uh, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, uh, wow. which is coming out on May 26th. And they revealed in that trailer that this is the last performance of Ke- Kevin Conroy as Batman. Oh, yeah. I saw that, actually. And, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was wondering if you'd bring that up. Yeah. I, lo- I love those Rockstar Arkham games, which yeah. this is... Uh, just recently, there was a game, Gotham Knights, that came out that got really bad reviews. It's from Rockstar, but not from the people that did the Arkham series. Yeah. This is what the Arkham developers were working on. Oh, okay. Is this Suicide Squad game, where it's like you're playing as the Suicide Squad, and the Justice League is being mind-controlled, and you go through and, and kill all the superheroes. <laughs> that sounds fun. Yeah, it looks like a really fun game. Um, I imagine you... Because... Uh, 
I like those games. You don't like the the rhythm style yeah, combat. I don't like the combat at all. Yeah, so it's probably not a game for you, but mm-hmm. uh, but you can come over and watch me play it like we sure. used to do with the Arkham games. Yeah, that's true. Just kind of chill there and you're doing some shit. All right, so is that it? My uh, turn? Yeah, your turn. All right, this is a shorty and I just wanted to I just wanted to point it out because this is this podcast is uh, uh officially enthusiasts for everything dune mm-hmm. and dune 2 officially wrapped uh tim Ooh. tim uh timothy chamelet tweeted about it and wrapped and this was like yesterday so uh the current release date for it is november 17th of 2023 that's been pushed back since yeah. october um it's going to be exclusive to theaters mm-hmm. no uh no streaming because that's denis favorite uh thing and um for me that's my, what led to we talked about last episode legendary pulling out of warner brothers and going over uh to sony yeah was because they released all those movies on hbo and legendary is like uh no theatrical no legendary that's lame because I like HBO releases. I do not like theatrical releases, but I will go see this, of course. Um, I'm most excited for Christopher Walken is Emperor Shaddam the Fourth. Mm-hmm. That's that's for me. That's going to be like amazing. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this, especially even now after uh, watching this movie has got me re-energized on Daniel Villeneuve. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, I was we were in the bag from the start on that. Easily. I mean, we both loved the the last one, and mm-hmm. pretty much everything that I've watched from this guy has been yeah. pretty much gold. All right, so what do we got for a podcast? Oh, oh you got one more. I got one and more. Then I got we'll one podcast more. Field. Yeah, uh, Lewis County, Washington. A moose was sighted for the first time. Oh, that's cool. In Mount Rainier National Park. That's the first time a moose has been photographed in Southwest Washington. I think that's. Uh, stretching the South, boundary Southwest, of, yeah, of Southwest Washington. Like if, really, if you divide it into, into four, four. <laughs> blocks, he came into the Southwest block. Um, but this is the first time that's happened. The The moose is believed to have made advantage of uh, the I-90 wildlife undercrossings uh, near Resort Creek. Oh, cool. And he came down uh, Southwest of Snoqualmie Pass and, um, there was another moose reported in that area in September. It's probably actually the same the same moose. Sure. Um, but those wildlife underpasses work. Like yeah, they really should just th- build more of those. Yeah, they're expensive, but I mean, it's uh, driving through like Eastern Oregon. You don't you go through long stretches where you don't see any roadkill for the longest time, mm-hmm. and then you cross over into Idaho where they don't uh, make yeah. any considerations towards animals, and it's just like uh, carniceria all over the <laughs> all over the freeway. Yeah. Um. So those work, and it's just really cool. Uh, animals are are out there thriving despite all the challenges in the world. Yeah, I'm down. I like moose, and <laughs> I'm glad that we have them in Washington. Um, so now let's get into our podcast. Fuel. Yeah. So today's podcast f- fuel is Journey to the Red Planet. Uh, you know, the, the off-world colonies are a big deal in mm-hmm. the Blade Runner series. That's why I chose that. Spaceman on the front. Yeah. And it's uh, it's a red ale, 6% ABV. Um, the On the can, it says a red ale of the finest quality, original, iman- imaginative, and disturbing. <laughs> and that's credited to, to you in tapped uh, as the, the quote. Um, this won bronze in category at the Oregon Beard Awards, and it's just you know a good Irish red ale. Yeah, it's nice and full. Like this mm-hmm. is this isn't thin by any means. It, when I took a drink of it, I was like, "Whoa, what's this?" Yeah, it's got that. It's got a thick kind of malty mouth. It's a good. It's a good winter beer for sure. Uh, sadly, to report, Sasquatch is shutting down their Ooh. commercial brewing operation. They're going to keep the Southwest uh, Portland Pub open. Um, but they're not brewing any of their award-winning beers or ciders anymore. Wow. Um, they're just going to be a pub. And they're, uh, if you're interested, you can buy beer online. They're selling through all their inventory. Hmm. And they still have new beers uh, coming out because they had full fermenters when they decided to, to pull the plug. Um, wow. But once once they're done, they're done. We're no more Sasquatch. I, I wonder why. I guess just distribution didn't wasn't profitable, but slinging hamburgers is. I guess like it's just good enough because basically, um, you know, in their posts they're talking about the increased costs and how much the aluminum costs and everything, and they're just not making the margins they need. 
even though they're just, a, they're a successful brewery, you know, winning awards and everything, yeah. they're not making the profit they need to yeah, make they can't the be business paying work. People salaries and stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. So R.I.P. Sasquatch. We'll we'll enjoy these last few Sasquatch brews while we can. Sounds good. So let's take a short break. We'll come back and get into this uh, mammoth of a long movie. <laughs> Welcome back, divers. Let's dive into Blade Runner 2049, 2017, Denis Villeneuve. So this movie opens up with some oh, oh, oh. screen text. Let's talk about the prequel shorts. You wanted oh, me to. You wanted shit. me. You wanted me to bring those up. That's true. Because uh, I sent you the. I sent you the link. There's three canonical prequel shorts. Yeah. Uh, one's an animated one directed by Shinichiro Watanabe, uh, creator of Cowboy Bebop and Samurai mm-hmm. Champloo. Uh, and then the other two are directed by Luke Scott, son of the great Ridley Scott. Yeah. Um, and they all deal with uh, key events in the in the history of the Blade Runner universe in between the original Blade yeah, Runner yeah. and this one. Like in the movie, they reference the blackout yeah. several times. And it's the reason why all like records are wiped and all this stuff is weird. And so in one of the shorts, the animated one, it goes over like, how did the blackout occur? basically replicants were uh just they went totally rogue yeah they uh replicant radicals or revolutionaries or whatever uh blew up a server farm uh yeah. and and detonated like a warhead in in orbit and set off an, an emp and basically just wiped all the records of all the replicants uh on earth yeah so they could basically be off the map yeah and we find that this i think this is the first time that the that their serial number is in their right eye is is ever mentioned and so people pop out pop out their eye and then go incognito basically yeah but i mean come on a bunch of people with missing right eyes (laughs) there's too many of them (laughs) you're like that would become a dead giveaway that you're you're a, a rogue replicant yeah and then the the second one man check this out you pop out your left eye no one would ever suspect. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get them both, <laughs> but they wouldn't. They wouldn't suspect that like, only an idiot would have popped exactly. out both eyes. It's a total juke. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was uh, Blade Runner twenty thirty six Nexus Dawn. Uh, oh no no excuse me that was twenty twenty two Blackout. Then was twenty thirty six Nexus Dawn starring Jared Leto and Benedict Wong. Oh yeah, and that this was good. is. Uh, about the Wallace Corporation and the ending of, of prohibition on on replicants. Yeah, and, and then the third one uh, is 2048, and it's it's backstory on Dave Bautista's uh, Sapper Morton character. Yeah, I really liked these shorts, all mm-hmm. of them. Um, I, I mean, I think Jared Leto is amazing in this role as well. Yeah, he's a, it's a very divisive performance. Like, a lot of people say he's the worst part of the movie. Holy shit. Who are these people? <laughs> they don't, that is an amazing performance. I... I I actually agree with you. I think he I think he's really strong in this. I think the fact that he's is probably in real life a creepy yeah, megalomaniac. He's a creepster. So Yeah, it really lends to this performance like it it's it feels very lived in. Kind of like Dave Batista is a good genuine dude, mm-hmm. so you really like his character and think of him as a good genuine dude. That's true. Like he's that sort of guy like the the like the quintessential man that's slow to angry mm-hmm. or slow to anger, but he's capable of great violence. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like he's he is a monster that wants to be like a good guy. Yeah, he's and, he he's definitely like the you know the the Bruce Banner you wouldn't like. Yeah, him he's the Bruce Banner and the Hulk in the same yeah. body. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. So I um I had not actually watched these shorts before, but I watched them before rewatching the film. Uh, and they're not necessary, but they're all enriching to the movie. Yeah, for sure. I, I didn't think, like, when I watched these, I was like, oh, these are cool. These are fun. And then when I was watching the movie, I was like, oh, okay, they're referencing a thing I know about now. Yeah. So that's cool, but I didn't think you needed them in any way. No. They just deep. And it, it was just like maybe 30 minutes worth of content, 35 minutes. Yeah, was, maybe not even. Yeah. They're short. Yeah. They're, they're real short. So And they're on YouTube, so those are worth tracking down. Yeah. 
So uh, the screen text it starts off, and it's just telling us what we already knew from the first movie, mm-hmm. um, you know, about replicants and the rebellion, and then it then it gets to some new content where it talks about Wallace Corporation buying up t- uh, Tyrell, and uh, basically how the Nexus Eights had longer lifespans than previous models, yeah, etc. Which we kind of know that too, because like that's what. Um, uh, Sean Young's character Rachel was a was a Nexus Eight. Yeah, that's why she had an open ended lifespan. Uh, hypothetically, Deckard, if he is a replicant, he's a Nexus Eight. And I think it's worth mentioning if you're you know deep diving this movie uh-huh. um, that um, Ridley Scott says that he is a replicant. Yeah, so um, I'm 100 percent on the on the he is a replicant train. Yeah, he's a Nexus Eight. I like that Harrison Ford doesn't believe it because that's where the headspace that he needs to be in to play the character the way he plays it. Oh, that he's not a replicant. Yeah, he plays it as though he's not a replicant. Or mm-hmm. he really believes he's not a replicant. Yeah, you that's, know what I mean? That's the, I think that's how you got to play it. Yeah. Because Deckard doesn't believe he's a replicant. Harrison Ford, um, he's an interesting actor. He he doesn't he thinks of himself not as an artist but as a craftsman because he he has a carpentry background, mm-hmm. and he says he builds he builds his performance uh, like the way he builds a piece of furniture, huh? And and I think it's uh, it's a it, it's a really interesting way to look at acting, um, and he's a he's a pretty cool guy. Yeah, I th- I think that he's he's also I mean to say that Harrison Ford is an excellent performer is kind of a you know like mm-hmm. of course everyone thinks yeah. that but we're I, all aware of this. I <laughs> like it when he's in these more thinky roles, uh-huh. you know, like yeah, Indiana Jones, no thank you. I, Definitely I, give I, me. I'm not Deckard. going there with that. <laughs> like I like Indiana Jones too. Yeah, they're making another one of those flicks. Look, have you watched the trailer? Uh, no, I haven't. I, it looks great. I didn't watch the last Indiana Jones movie. You're better off. Skip that one. <laughs> You know, I have, I'm a fi- I'm fifty fifty on that shit. I skip a lot of things, and people are like, "Good, yeah, <laughs> yeah." No, skip Crystal Skull. I actually like. I find myself not to do too much of a tangent on, on indie, but I ca- I refer to the Indiana Jones movies as a trilogy because there's the three that count. Yeah, and then in the weird period of Spielberg, where he's revisiting, where he's nostalgic for his himself, <laughs> that's where you get Crystal Skull. Oh, man. And Crystal Skull was very bad. Like, there it, should be a term for being nostalgic for yourself. I mean, it's just sort of like masturbatory. Yeah, I was going to. I was going to. I was going to go that way. I was going to call it like auto nostalgia. Mm, that's good. Auto nostalgic masturbation. That's what. That's what uh, Spielberg's still in that mode. That's what. He, that's all his movies now. Sad. Um, but okay, back to this. Um, we see we see this this text scroll and then we get mm-hmm. a close up of an eyeball yeah and then it kind of melds the scenery and we get into we see these big circular solar farms out in kind of a a wasteland desert and yeah. we learn that this is California twenty forty nine yeah we're flying and they're um, and then we're going out over protein farms yes. where they're where they're farming like grub worms. And we have this really cool flying car. Mm -hmm. It's got three wheels, two in the front, one in the back. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get to see these really rad landscapes. I mean, my notes are dotted with, this is a really cool landscape. Yeah. This is a cool panorama. And part of why this stuff uh, hits the way it does is because they're real models and not not CG. Yeah. Um, And your brain just knows a real thing when it when it sees it yeah and so it feels like you're flying over a real landscape as opposed to this is video game nonsense which is what a lot of movies feel like yeah and and that's the same way that they took the the prop master Mm -hmm. uh uh approached this where everything is as real as possible like all of the guns are crafted from metal frames and they have carbon fiber pieces casted in and it's all attached in it's not mono piece with you know painted different colors it's all separate things so you can see the seam lines in Mm -hmm. them and they they have mechanisms so when it goes you actually see the minute moving parts and even if you don't consciously notice the moving parts your subconscious mind sees it and absorbs it it's it's information that you edit out naturally yeah but you know real when you see real exactly and this is the same technique that Villeneuve brings into uh, 
Dune, right? With the yeah. ornithopters and everything. They really plot out how these machines work so that they feel like a real thing when you see them operating. Yeah. Um, just a key little detail. Uh, our protagonist, K. Ryan Gosling, he's asleep in the car. Yes. Represent. He's asleep metaphorically in the story at this point, right? Because yeah. he do, he doesn't know about the mystery he's about to get drawn into. The sleeper into. has not awakened. No, <laughs> he has not yet. Yeah, we get a thing a, a text that says in 2049, 30 years after the following uh, following the events of Blade Runner, bioengineered humans known as refl- replicants are slaves. Mm-hmm. So we know from the uh from the short that Wallace broke the prohibition, mm-hmm. but now they're just slaves. He got it re repealed because yeah. he created replicants that could be controlled and would not rebel. Yes. Um, so yes, literally now they're nothing more than slaves and are not capable of anything more than, than slave labor. Or so we think. Or so we think. Yeah. Until the, until the sleeper awakens. Yes. And so the flying car lands near this farming operation mm-hmm. and it cuts to a guy in the greenhouse wearing all, it's not really a greenhouse. It's a grub house. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> uh, he's wearing protect all this protective gear, like mop hazard gear or whatever. And he's mm-hmm. farming these, these proteins and, um, it's just pretty gnarly. That's our bleak future. Get, get used to eating grubs, people. Heck yeah. I hope I'm dead by then. <laughs> um, and then we see K, uh, uh, K, the name of the cop, it's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and he's going in, he's a Nexus nine mm-hmm. and he's going into this guy's, um, into this guy's house. And we learn that this guy, he's a he's a blade runner we're yeah. led to led to believe he's you know he's a replicant who hunts replicants to right. retire them right which you know i'm of the of the opinion that blade runners have always been replicants that 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 has always been the case you but think, but k knows yeah he's there's no illusions about it yeah k knows he's a replicant i think deckard as the earlier model had to have the he had to have the belief that he was not a replicant. So you don't think there were other Blade Runners that weren't replicants, like the origami folding guy? Gaff? Or is he just, he's not a Blade Runner, he's a minder or a tender? I, yeah, I think Gaff is not really a Blade Runner. Gaff is a handler. Like, mm. a, he he maneuvers the Blade Runners around. I love that they got Gaff back for this movie. Mm-hmm. I know, like, Lisa says, didn't he have jet black hair before? I was like, yeah, it's it's been a long time. Yeah, that was the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Edward James almost is very old now. <laughs> so, anyways, Kay just goes in uh, to Sapper's house, has a seat, and he, and he just waits in there. Yeah, and it, we have this drone that takes off from the car and it's mm-hmm. hovering around. And uh, I'm not going to try to dr- uh, to dwell on every single little detail like this, but this is the first appearance of the drone, and I think it's pretty dope looking. It, it's like it's kind of scary ish because it just hovers. Yeah, it's, I like it, and it re- it responds to his like his voice commands, and and he does like hand signals. You know, he he just sort of like he gives it a a, a whirly mm-hmm. a whirly with his finger, and it's like kind of go around and take pictures of everything. Because it's a, like a crime scene photographer he brings with him, essentially. Yeah, and I could definitely see this as in the future of policing. I mean, mm-hmm. they have, and I was uh, I was overseas with the mil- military like over a decade ago, and we had drones around our base where we could get eyes on things with mm-hmm. our with our predator drones and whatnot. So this is just this is just going to happen. The military already has this. Yeah, and so Sapper comes. He gets out of his protective gear and he comes in and they start out with a a fairly civil conversation. Yeah, they have a nice little uh, verbal exchange like, what do you farm? It's a protein farm. Yeah, he slaps some grubs down on the table. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, he... He he seems like he empathizes with Sapper. He talks about his like his military service mm-hmm. and how how hard that likely was, you know, because he's got his combat medic medic bag that he carries around with him. Yeah, and you know that's a pretty common trope. How like veterans often have like little pieces of military gear that they just became familiar with and liked. Mm-hmm. I know I have lots of it around. Yeah, They're like oh, why wouldn't I just always carry this with me? It's got all everything I need in it. If I ever get hurt, I can patch myself up. If someone needs help, I can help them. Yeah, why you not? Know, like, and it's in a nice little handy bag that just hangs easy here. Yeah, and, and it makes me wonder, like, why is he... 
why does he have to retire uh eight like like sapper sapper's just a farmer like yeah why because that's just let him farm yeah because they're just the they're getting rid of all the eights all the eights they're considered to well for one he he is involved in like revolutionary stuff back in the day sure but But, there's no indication that k knows that i think he does i think it's in the case he's just sort of it's implied that this is a bad guy yeah um I mean, it's to him, it's not here nor there whether the guy's sure. a bad guy. And he even says, like, he said, you know, Sapper says to him, are you, are you here to bring me in? And he's like, sir, if bringing you in is an option, I would prefer that. Yeah. And he says, how does it feel, feel killing your own kind? Yeah. It's a great line. Um, and I think, uh, I know I've said it before in previous uh, episodes, but Dave Batista is a hell of an actor. Dave Batista is a hell of an actor. I think he is probably uh, John Cena's nipping at his heels now yeah. but like as far as wrestlers turned actor mm-hmm. Batista's top of the pyramid I mean right after Macho Man Randy Savage <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget his star turn as Bonesaw in Spider-Man <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or any of those great movies Hulk Hogan made. oh man <laughs> <laughs> the one where he's an alien or where he's a nanny <laughs> <laughs> Man, I don't even remember those, but yeah, yeah I I, just, I definitely like John Cena in uh, in everything, honestly. Yeah. But Dave Batista also, I think Dave Batista is uh, the one who does the most actually like acting. Like, yeah, he outacts The Rock like oh, easy. The Rock just plays The Rock. Yeah, he, like, he's just himself. <laughs> and I as my I enjoy that, right? Like I enjoy The Rock playing The Rock the same way Schwarzenegger played Schwarzenegger yeah, and everything. Sure. But Dave Batista is interested in the craft of acting, and I don't think The Rock is. The Rock just <laughs> wants to be a movie star. Yeah, he's just rich. Um, I think John Cena discovered the craft of acting accidentally and was like, "Well, through, this is through comedy." <laughs> yeah, like this is actually kind of more fulfilling than wrestling. <laughs> like, For sure. And I can do it when I'm old, whereas. I'll die if I continue racing. Yeah, like Batista's in his fifties. He, yeah. he, you know, he's not going to be able to be, you know, he's the aging veteran in this movie. Exactly. So, and that's five yeah. years ago. It's when and because he's uh, normally has his head shaved. So like when his hair is grown out and you see like he's the, bald. He's got the, the, the Captain cold, Picard. Yeah, the cul-de-sac going on. It's like he looks old with that hair. It ages him quite a bit. Sure. Um. Anyways. Taking him in is not an option. Yep. He he pulls his scalpel out of his medical bag, and they get into a real Donnybrook of a fight. Yeah, a hell of a fight. It's yeah. really good. Um, yeah, Batista like bashes Gosling through the wall, like pounds down the wall with his face, and then uh, Ryan Gosling crushes his windpipe. Yeah, it's like at first it just seems like, oh yeah, Sapper is gonna just destroy him. But then you see how the uh, the Model Nines are faster, stronger, tougher. Yeah, they're no they're no joke. Um, but those Model Eights are no joke either yeah. because he recovers from the crushed windpipe and and gets back up. Like yep. it's because and uh, Kay is like, oh, please don't get up. Like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you Ryan Gosling is tremendous in this movie because he's absolutely miserable in his job yeah um he he gets no fulfillment from being a uh, replicant that hunts replicants yeah it is a terrible existence and he never seems like he likes it no nope. um it's all he's doing this reluctantly because he has to yeah i think ryan gosling doesn't really get enough uh, credit for being an awesome actor he's great in everything he does yeah i mean he, people just kind of I think they write him off because he's really handsome. Sometimes when you're handsome, and I, I suffer from this too. Sometimes <laughs> some people, <laughs> some people diminish your capability. Yeah, <laughs> often people consider me a himbo. <laughs> yeah. So he retires. Uh, he retires Sapper, and he takes his his eye. He scans it with a little yep. QR code reader, and then pops it out, puts it in the evidence bag, and he's like photograph everything to yeah. the drone and yeah. and and uh he calls into the department and mm-hmm. he's talking to his lieutenant mm-hmm. and um this is kind of the first time we get a side view of the car like a full profile mm-hmm. and i'm always calling out the cars in every yeah. movie the cars look cool in this. i'll Fucking give you that cool like i want one of those cars like i would drive that um yeah yeah so he calls uh 
Lieutenant Joshi, uh, the great Robin Wright. I know. Like, I was like, Wonder Woman's mom? Yeah, like, she's a hard ass in this, too. <laughs> she's good. It's not her mom. It's her her auntie that's, oh, the, gen- okay. that's the general of the Amazons. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, yeah. You know what I meant, though. Yeah, yeah. To- I mean, she's the, the general of the Amazons in this, too. She's the badass. Yeah, I really like this casting. I was like, wow, this... This lady, this lady's hardcore. Yeah, I'll say this too. Another controversial opinion: Denis Villeneuve casts the hell out of a movie. Yeah, even the minor characters are all people that like you're like, oh, I love this guy. In oh, like that... the Somali pirate. Yeah, like, the Somali who's, pirate, who's or analyst. the or the guy from the the Walking Dead that runs the shady orphanage. It's like yep. there are lots of like smaller character actors, but great character actors Mm -hmm. in everything yeah he chooses he chooses really good people to play these roles so anyways while he's doing his debrief with the boss uh, he notices a little yellow flower Mm -hmm. uh, at the base of this dead tree that's kind of held up by cables and i really like that imagery just this Uh dead tree held up by cables yeah that's the that's the world yeah you know that's the world of 2049 where it's this dead planet that's just held together like we're cling into it yeah. um and there's another thing it's a yellow flower that that makes him get out of the car um in the the color story of the movie uh things that are yellow are always leading k towards the truth and then things uh-huh. that are red are blocking his path and so the the door into sapper's house is yellow the flower is yellow sapper has the red uh hazmat suit on like there's just these little details like that mark kind of mark clues and mark obstacles. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things that I think is going to, is easy to call out just over and over again is the cinematography in this movie, how they just, they use visual cues for storytelling. It's mm-hmm. the essence of show. Don't tell. Yeah. Um, they Roger, do it a lot. Roger Deakins won an Academy award. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for his cinematography in this movie. And he'd been nominated many times in the past. Um, but this is a masterpiece for cinematography. Yeah, I, I think I think it goes without saying that the, the cinematography in this movie is probably one of its top features, like mm-hmm. one of the best parts of it. Yeah. Because you're just you're constantly blown away by the 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 look and style. Yeah. And so we're at real risk of making this a three hour podcast. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, let's uh He flies back. The drone scans something under the tree yes. and they and Robin Wright says she'll send a dig team. He needs to come back for his uh baseline. Yes. Which we don't know what that is yet. Yeah, so he goes back and he's he flies back. We get a really cool aerial cityscape view. This mm-hmm. is our first view of a city. I That's, won't call it out every single time, but this is our first one. And this it's a is, great model again. This is as cyberpunk as a city gets. Mm-hmm. We have huge blocky monoliths, like brutalist uh, architecture. Yeah. But you also have like hologram, uh, holographic advertisement everywhere. You have neon lights. You have mm-hmm. a a combination of extremely bright spots and extremely dark spots. It's yeah. just ex- the the contrast in this cityscape is is extreme. I love it. And it is the natural progression from the original Blade Runners 2019. Yes. Not from our future. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. this is built on that world, not, you know, 20 years in the future from our time now like it would be yeah they use they use the original blade runner as like a history study mm-hmm. and then just tried to extrapolate from there not yeah. from what we have like again in the in the uh costuming and stuff nobody's walking around with cell phones or wrist watches or anything it's like a, that it's a fairly analog world which yeah considering they had a major technological setback with the blackout that kind of all tracks sure um so he goes in for his baseline which is essentially like where they it's almost like like the winter soldier protocol thing where yeah. they're where they're saying words and he needs to repeat certain words back and he needs to stay uh cucumber cool through the whole thing yeah and he just he's like nothing shakes him and and mm-hmm. the evaluator even says so like yeah like always call him k or whatever yeah and he uh he has a rough time in the police station. Like the other cops yeah. are shitty to him. They're like, like call him a skin job. Yeah. Skin job. And like, kind of like 
jump at him and to make him flinch and he has to he walks around with it you know, like averting his eyes like it's like the jim crow south yeah and it's really tough and he goes in there uh to talk to lieutenant joshi and she's not great to him like she's more friendly than other people but she still treats him like a subhuman well she treats him like an appliance yeah well he oh, just he, just slightly more affectionate than appliance yeah I like mean, a useful pet yeah i mean i don't know but i've seen people treat their cell phones with more regard than people than yeah. he is treated with yeah and it's really hard because he, Ryan Gosling has these great sad puppy eyes. Yeah. And he just looks miserable through the whole thing. Like, and I guess that, like I said, that's why I find him so much more engaging is that like, you just feel bad for him from the start. Yeah. Like it's not, um, it's not, there's nothing. What were we talking about? Uh, Minority Report. There's oh, nothing yeah. heroic going on in that movie. There's nothing heroic going on in this movie. Not yet. Him. Well, yeah. Him killing Dave Batista was not heroic. No, not it at was all. sad. Mm-hmm. Everyone was sad about it. And he gets back, and his boss is shitty to him. He goes home to his like his terrible apartment block, and he's it's, got racist graffiti on yeah, the it's on the door. Fuck off, Skinner. Yeah, and the one thing he has to look forward to is like a holographic chat bot that he has. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I was thinking like, okay, so at first I was like, oh, he's talking to a chat bot at yeah. first. And then she's holographic. He has a projector in the center of the room and it has an arm so it can mm-hmm. kind of go to the different areas of the apartment. Yeah, She brings him a holographic meal, sets it on top of his meal. So I was thinking, because um, we later learned that this is made by Wallace as well, this, mm-hmm. this bot. I don't actually think it's a bot in the way that we have chat bots right now like you can hold a conversation with a chat bot and it's hard to discern anything and in japan there are services where you can pay a companion that will text you all day and there it's actually a person that it's their job um but i definitely think this is something in the future that we will see and i don't actually think that uh his his companion is any less of an ai than he is really i don't think um i don't think she's as sophisticated an ai as he is but i do believe she is an ai yes she absolutely has sentience approaching i think approach Hmm. like i think there's uh and i think he comes to that realization she's a mirror sure she tells him what he wants to hear basically um you know, what's interesting, as to kind of get into what we see later in the movie, she's supposed to be kind of a sex bot. Sure. But that's yeah. not how he uses her. He uses her as a companion because he's alone in the world, right? Because yeah. he's a replicant that hunts replicants. Humans hate him and replicants hate him. So this is really the only companionship he can get is this hologram. Yeah. I and mean, so he's made her into a life partner. I wonder... I wonder if um, hologram chatbots or whatever, or even non-holographic, or mm-hmm. even if it was just like on a screen on your wall or something, if chatbots or uh, unsophisticated unsophistic- s- AIs, however you want to think about it, I wonder if those are a thing of the future for like seniors who are really uh, lonely, oh, like yeah. that kind of thing, like... Um, I could definitely see it being something that would be, I don't know if it's the best option, but certainly therapeutic for people who, who yeah. need mental stimulation. Like they're going to talk to you and have discussions about things mm-hmm. and ask you to recall, tell them stories and yeah. things so that people's brains can stay active. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of utilities, uh, beyond, porn i wouldn't <laughs> you know mind what I mean? having one of these as an assistant to me for my oh, job yeah and i think you would get attached to it because it's going to learn things and like and develop a personality like she has yeah um that'd be cool i'd be fine with that i think that i don't hate machines i i think that's <laughs> cool i i mean i honestly i think that that is inevitable i think i think that level of ai already exists most likely it's probably just expensive as hell yeah and i think that this sort of thing is inevitable and we haven't said uh 
Joy is played by Anna de Armas, mm-hmm. and her performance is incredible too. Yeah, I think I think she does a really good job at being uh, realistic but slightly fake. Yeah, and it, it, this is what the movie benefits from return viewings mm-hmm. because she leads the story in a way that's not immediately uh, apparent. You know what I mean? Yeah. She leads the narrative and she leads K. Um, that you in a way that you you don't pick up the first time it, it comes through much more clear the second time where you see how she's she's telling him what he wants to hear yeah for sure um and so anyways he's got her a present that's the big yeah thing he of this used scene. his bonus from retiring sapper mm-hmm. to buy a mobile holographic unit yeah so she can leave the apartment now yeah and she's um they go up on the roof and they have a really sweet uh kind of romantic moment and she's excited and she's like yeah she's excited for the rain and she's just excited to leave the apartment that she's never been outside of um yeah like she can go with him she can drive around with him and stuff and then the whole thing um gets shut down because he he gets a a phone call and she just pauses yeah oof because it's like run from his cell phone yeah hurts it like because he was like like it was the first time you saw he was kind of coming out of his shell a little bit and approaching a happy moment. Yeah. And then it's immediately uh, back to work. Cause he, he bought a gift for his AI Mm -hmm. and it's like, by having her pause when he gets a call from his boss it just highlights that she's not real she's just an ai and basically he just bought himself a gift yeah so that he can have a a a more fulfilling relationship with the with the hologram yeah yeah but i mean that's just we do stuff like that just like when you buy skins for a video game character sure you know it's like and you you spend real money for fake clothes (laughs) it's that is a sort of thing that people do yeah that's fine. Yeah. And, and I'm totally okay with that kind of thing. And I would buy a, I would buy a AI assistant in a second. That'd be mm-hmm. dope. And a projector so you could take her with you. And she ride your car <laughs> and then you can go in the carpool lane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except for it looks like Anna de Armas. <laughs> and so it's like every, as the cops drive by, like, uh-uh, no, I, I have one of those too. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's their, their hologram is pointing at you. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, uh-uh, and you're, you're not carpooling. <laughs> He's like, you got one in your car. <laughs> That's just like, you can't text and drive, but they have that big laptop. They have a laptop that they, <laughs> they uh, can write emails and drive. Yeah, bonkers. Anyways, the forensics team discovered there was a human skeleton in that box. Mm-hmm. That's why he needs to go back to work. Uh, and it's a, it's a female. She died from complications during childbirth 30 yep. years ago. And... Um, there's some superficial cuts that suggest there was a cesarean, cesarean section. Yeah, yeah, there's like cuts on some some clean cuts that were probably incidental on the pelvis. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and and so it uh, we have K looking at this, and he's you know he's got his replicant eyes mm-hmm. and noticing detail, and he's like zoom in, zoom in, like look, move this, this there, and then he f- zooms in and he finds a serial number in the bone. Yeah. How is that they they've woven the serial number into the bones because wow. it's like it's on the internal like you cut the bone and it's got the the Nexus Eight serial number. Yeah, in there. and then uh, Joshi or Joshi whatever yeah. she kind of freaks out. Yeah, she gives a she takes him back to the office and she she gives him like a whole sort of speech about uh, the world's built on a wall separating kind mm-hmm. uh, basically, segregation. Yeah, if anyone finds out that there isn't a wall there's going to be a war or a slaughter. Yeah. And, and so she orders him to basically find the kid and retire it. Yeah. And anyone else that's involved in this thing, he's, he's just supposed to whack every Anyone discover the conspiracy and kill everyone involved. Yeah. And he says that he's, he's never retired anything with a soul. Yeah. Cause he's like, and nothing that was born. Yeah. Nothing that was born. She's like, what's the difference? Like to be born is to have a soul, I guess. And like, you know, it's his first sort of, and she says, are you saying no? And he says, I wasn't aware that was an option. Yeah. And so it's the first, he doesn't say, I am i can't say no. It's almost like it's that first chink that the, the idea of saying no is the first time it's ever come up. 
Yeah, he wasn't aware it was an option before. Now he does. Now he's like, what if I said no? Like, (laughs) like his wheels are just starting starting to turn. And he, um, there was like some strands of hair, Mm -hmm. Uh, and so he takes the the hair down to the to the Wallace Corporation uh, to learn more about the serial number. Yeah, and we get more badass cityscapes and mm-hmm. advertising everywhere, and it's really cool. And then when you get into the Wallace Corporation, which is the successor to the defunct Terrell Corporation, mm-hmm. it's just this completely like unuser friendly, brutalist architecture. It looks yeah. like Soviet block so, concrete buildings. Uh, Denis Villeneuve says that the idea is that the the Wallace Tower is a monument to to Wallace. Okay. And it's meant to withstand anything. Even if, as the sea levels continue to rise and the city is flooded, the tower will still be standing there. And okay. because Neander Wallace is blind, there's no windows uh, because he doesn't care about looking outside. Yeah. And so it, the whole building is a monument to himself and he doesn't care about uh, user friendliness for anyone else. Yes. Um, which it just tells you so much about the character, like like who he is. It's yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty striking. And mm-hmm. the guy that they have playing the the Wallace uh, employee, uh-huh. uh, God, what show was he on where he plays the the arms dealer? Anyway, oh, was that him? It, I I know I, who you're talking. Um, I could have sworn it was him because it was hilarious. Uh, and I it, know who you think that is but it's not it's not him it is it looks uh, like him. it looks a lot like him because it's another alopecia dude it's uh thomas le marquis marquis yeah thomas thomas le marquis huh. uh didn't even know loves to to bring the french canadians uh. in. <laughs> no disrespect to our quebecois listeners <laughs> just kidding well, we live in Washington. Yeah. Our neighbors, um, yeah. So I think that uh, th- that this guy was really creepy, mm-hmm. and I really liked, and I really liked it. Yeah. Um, I liked that um, the the guys immediately knows. Oh, this hair's from a pre blackout model. Yeah, like he's he's like a nerd for for, for replicants. replicants. Yeah. yeah, and he takes him back to like the the file lab or whatever the yeah. the card catalog, and pulls uh, pulls the file on Rachel. Um, and he kind of explains uh, about the blackout mm-hmm. dur- he, uh, during this walk, and he talks about why everything's stored on these data slates and stuff. Yeah. And if you haven't watched the short, that's mm-hmm. important information. Yeah. And so when they started pulling up this particular uh, file, we cut over to uh, the replicant uh, named Love, played by Sil- Sylvia Hooks. Um, yeah. She, and it, Basically, it it uh, she gets an alert and she cuts yes. she cuts short her her call with a client where she she was taking like a big corporate order of replicants for for a job, um, and but this demands her attention and she goes and takes over uh, the the what do you call it the exchange yeah. with uh, from the from the receptionist guy she goes and pulls the file and they go and they listen to uh, an audio recording of. Uh, Deckard giving Rachel the Voight-Comp test from the original yeah. Blade Runner. Which is kind of like the baseline test from this. Yeah, it way. is. Sort of, yeah. It, it it functions similarly, yeah. Yeah, and, and basically she's just, uh, she's, I don't know. It's like she's, she's sizing him up and trying to uh, figure out what he's all about. Yeah, and she's um, cooperate, cooperating but only telling as kind of as much as, as she wants him to know and kind of pointing him in the direction she wants him to go. Yeah. Um, and he makes some interesting observations of the recording too. Like he says that uh, it, he can tell from the recording that she likes him. She's like, she likes him. She's trying to provoke him. And then love responds, you know, that ask being asked personal questions is invigorating it shows interest. And so it's like you've got these two replicants analyzing the other replicant and like their personalities and stuff. Two replicants talking about two replicants talking. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Episode <laughs> title. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. We might come up with something better. Um, so there's not a ton of information there, 
but that sets him on the on the path of of finding out about Deckard, which is what takes him to the retirement home where Gaff is. Yeah, we get to see Commander Adama, mm-hmm. who's chilling out, and he's folding paper the whole time. He's yeah. making origami, which is a callback to Blade Runner. Yeah, and he makes a he makes a little sheep. Yeah, uh, you know the the kind that androids dream about. I thought this was a really cool scene. I'm really glad that they got the the original actor mm-hmm. and. Um, he basic he tells he tells Kay that Deckard is retired. Yeah, he's he's done. Which that has you know that's a double entendre, in yeah. in a way that it it could very well mean that he's dead. Yeah, you know that's what you do when yeah. you retire a uh, replicant. Yeah, but basically you know Gaff has stayed. Gaff more or less let Deckard go at the end of the first movie, and he's not helping anyone look for him. Yeah, he likes Deckard. Yeah. Gaff ended up being okay. Yeah, you know? I thought he was kind of a jerk yeah. in the first movie, but, but that was that was before I fully understood that he was minding a machine, and mm-hmm. that's why he was kind of callous. Yeah, but then he he you know he figured it out when he we figured it out. He also became sympathetic to the machine, like because yeah. that's the to whole his thing. AI chat it's bot. it's yeah, in <laughs> in a way, right? Like it's about uh, like Roger Ebert used to say about how. Uh, films are an empathy generating machine yes um you know over time you know you you develop empathy like you you see that these are people and you develop empathy for them yeah and then we cut over to wallace himself Mm -hmm. and he's examining a new model of a replicant yeah and he's got cyber eyes in and they're like being he they're like it seems like he's being fed images from these mobile cameras that fly around yeah so he he has his his uh blind eye his human eyes are intact but he's got like a bluetooth thing on yeah, the back on the a, back of his head jack or yeah. chip jack or something yeah. like that and so he's got little drones that fly around the room yeah it's very it's very creepy it gives you the sense that he's blind but he sees more than is humanly possible because they're scanning everything and this scene is just kind of a creep out scene like it's just just establishing this guy Uh this kind of reminds me of like a baron harkonnen scene where you're just kind of seeing him come out of the gnarly stuff that's a good comparison um and so he's examines this replicant and then he stabs her yeah because he he's kind of just monologuing to love uh who's got uh who seems very uncomfortable through the whole thing, right? Yeah, she's like she's not comfortable chilling with him because he's the big boss. Yeah, and he he uh, he takes this replicant. Um, he kind of like sort of semi comforts her and and wraps a blanket around her or whatever. And then you know he starts talking about how he can't make them bear children. And then he slices her belly open and she just falls and bleeds out there. Yeah, uh, and it's just it's very gross and uncomfortable and sad and um and love just stands there she can't do anything about it um and how she feels about him is not ever entirely clear to me like she she absolutely wants his approval like yes uh uh, more than anything but she also seems repulsed in this in this scene to me anyway yeah and um and then Wallace tells her that he needs to go and steal Rachel's remains and uh, like follow Kay and yeah. get Rachel's child. Yeah, because he basically he wants uh, replicants to be able to reproduce on their own in order to ha- yeah. to have a because they can't you know it's, that way there's an unending supply. Yeah, of he them, wants to go from having made millions to producing trillions. Yeah, because he's trying to populate unpopulated planets. Yes. Um. Yeah, he's got a real crazy god complex yeah definitely a god complex yeah um and and rachel is the proof that replicates can do it and he wants to know how how to engineer that um we cut back over to Kay, and he's down in like the the entertainment district or whatever and we see uh, a woman in a in a cloak go up to some replicant sex workers and ask them to to you know find out what he's about he killed sapper and we want to know what he's doing. Yeah, I really like that there's r- umbrellas everywhere. Uh-huh. It's always that's, raining. That's another good callback uh, to the original. Um, and, and I thought it was cool that there was an interesting an advertisement about a Soviet Union uh, ballet. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, uh, in 
Neuromancer, the USSR has also not fallen. Oh, I think it's a okay. it's a common um, it's a common thing from uh, cyberpunk stuff that was done in the in the eighties or, or before that uh, the Soviet Union is assumed that it will stay together. Yeah, so that's pretty cool that they kept that. They didn't change it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so these three, these three ladies walk over to Kay mm-hmm. and, uh, they're like kind of put on, putting on the schmooze and one of them is pretty quick. Like he's a blade runner. Yeah. Nah. She, she recognizes them and doesn't want any, any part of that deal. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, Mariette played by Mackenzie Davis. She kind of stick around, sticks around and talks to him for a little while. Yeah, tries to butter him up. Yeah. And it's just. He's not interested, and she's like, "Oh, you don't like real girls." Yeah, because like, his walks away. His uh, his joy bling it rings him, and he's uh, his ringtone's the Peter and the Wolf song, mm-hmm. and that's when she's like, "Oh yeah, you don't like real girls," and and walks off. Um, and so, what was the what's the phone call? He's he's got a call from there to go. I guess, oh, return to Sapper's yeah, farm. Yeah, he has to go back to Sapper's farm, and uh, basically, he's like looking around, and he finds something in the piano, mm-hmm. a little baby sock. And there's a baby sock. It's this little metal case, mm-hmm. and uh, then there's a picture where there's a lady standing next to the tree. Yeah, it's Rachel, and he then he burns the house down, destroys yeah, all that evidence. Gotta gotta get rid of it. Ah, yeah. Sad times. Yeah. Why? And as he's leaving he thinks about uh the tree because uh that was the one kind of clue mariette gave him when he was talking to her because uh, he was looking at a picture of the tree and yeah. she was saying it's weird to keep a dead tree yeah you know and so he goes back and looks at it and the tree um has a date carved yeah, into the, 6 10 21 yeah and he's upset when he when he he sees that date yeah and it he because it's familiar to him. Yeah. So now, do you think this is June 10th, 2021, or is this October 6th, 2021? You know, we're in America, so I'm going to assume it's, it's, it's our it's our American it's, numbering okay. tradition. Well, Denis Villeneuve, you know, he he's might, Canadian yeah. and French Canadian at that. So it, it could go either way. It ultimately doesn't matter. It doesn't actually matter. Uh, yeah. It's just that it's a familiar number. Yeah. And so he goes back uh, to report to, to Joshi and uh, she tells him about the, you know, Coco, who was the forensic examiner played by uh, uh, David Desmalchen. Uh He was murdered and the remains were stolen. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, she's she's drinking his whiskey and like she's she's obviously stressed out about the whole thing. And she asks him to tell tell her one of his implanted childhood memories. And and I like how she says this will break the world. Yeah. And I was looking this lady up when I, Robin Wright up, and I was like, I didn't realize she played in the Princess Bride. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh that, yeah. yeah, that's Princess that, Buttercup, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I was like, oh okay, okay. That's why this face kind of yeah, it's, it's got my childhood uh-huh. like recognition. Yeah. For sure. Um, and he tells this story about how he, when he was a little kid, he had a, a, a wooden horse and there was this group of older boys chasing him, trying to take it away from him. Uh, and so he hid it in this furnace to protect it and they and they beat him. Um, and but he never told them yeah, where he, he never he, revealed. Yeah. And, you and know, she kind of hails him for being like stalwart. And- yeah. And then she um, she kind of like comes on to him like she she makes a you know, uh, are you interested in having sex with me kind of thing to him? And yeah, I think it was a little more subtle than that. Yeah. Oh yeah. She <laughs> goes, she goes, so, uh, what happens when this bottle's empty? Cause she's drinking his whiskey and he's like, shouldn't you get back to work? And she's like, all right. Guess so. <laughs> yep. And, and she leaves. Um, and then joy kind of comes online and is like, you didn't tell her the whole story. And he's like, I told her, I told her what she wanted to know. He's like, but you didn't tell her about the date. And we see the horse had that same date on it. Carved on the that, bottom. That was on the tree. Yeah. And and so I think that that's, that's an interesting scene there. Mm-hmm. And it made me wonder, like, did, did, um, did Kay not notice that she was coming on to him? Or did she, he not want to accept her, uh, her uh, advances because his holographic lady is there or what like, or, or I don't know. 
or is he just she's the boss i don't know i don't think uh i don't think he doesn't show any interest in anyone but joy yeah like i think he's one, true he's 100 percent in on joy um and is not interested in anyone else um so in real life if you knew somebody and they were totally absolutely absorbed with their chat bot like that was their relationship you'd probably think they were like mentally ill probably but if they themselves were an android if they <laughs> yeah if they themselves are a synthetic being it's a little bit different and the fact that he can't he just is outside of society entirely yeah he doesn't have a lot of options i think um i mean i'm glad he doesn't sleep with with joshi because yeah. she does not have any respect for him as as a as a human at all and you know, so i think ultimately that's the oh yeah that's he the would, problem it would have been it like you said been, an appliance like an appliance where no consent could be possibly given because she can't he can't say no to her he can't say no because of their power dynamic right so that would be and he uh, literally can't yeah yeah because he's programmed too but yeah. i was wondering like it's, so do they have um i mean is it just that k is too poor to afford a skin job uh companion like i'm sure no, they other don't. people have skin job companions the other replicants don't like him because he's a blade runner oh that's true that's true he is a he is a hunter of replicants so he's just like despised he well the, so, do the you, so do you think the other replicants would have a replicant companion yeah or people would have yeah. a replicant i think the other replicants like if you look at like the first movie and or even in this movie you look at sapper and how attached sapper is to uh to rachel and to the other people yeah. he was involved with like in the movement or whatever they have a lot of camaraderie with each other sure um so he's just uh he's just a pariah yeah because you know he hunts his own kind he, let's be uh, real he's garbage <laughs> <laughs> but not by choice like he has no he, choice in he, it. he didn't have choice and it sucks yeah um i think well he's developing choice though like that's he, a, yeah he's this pretty, is, he's this, coming out of it this is another step um he's he's a, hiding things from from he's a frankenstein's from monster yeah he's beca- he's become or he's becoming one yeah, yeah, or, he, he's a pinocchio is he's become, oh, he's uh, becoming a real boy oh that's he's, true that's true so he's um uh, he turns her down and he also hides things from her, you know? Mm. So it's like, he's, he is just, he should have got it over with and strangled her right there. <laughs> <laughs> like Frank <Frankenstein>. yeah. <laughs> 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 I want to see Ryan Gosling play Frankenstein, but just stay handsome. You must stay handsome. <laughs> yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I'm, just, I'm, I'm like the, force for slowing everything down yeah. in this, this one um so he goes to the to the dna bank and starts going through uh birth he's going through june 10th uh 2021 looking at birth records and uh he he puts he puts joy on the table so she can help him and like they're both like she overlays with him and they're both looking at the microfiche while they're going through yeah. the, the birth records. It's pretty interesting that such an analog technology is still in use. Yeah, because everything that was digital got wiped. Yeah, so they figure, well, I guess we got to back things up in this old yeah. school way in case it happens again. And so as they're flipping through there, he hits um, a birth, two birth records that are identical on the same date uh, with the same... Uh, DNA, but one's a boy and one's a girl, and they can't they can't literally be the the same person. So this is suspicious, and it leads him to uh, an orphanage in the ruins of San yes. Diego. And as he's kind of flying that way, we get we get to see a new part of the city. We get to see the huge ocean wall that kind of reminds me of Pacific Rim. Yeah. Um. And we get and then as it gets out past that, because he's going to San Diego, so he's heading south from LA. Mm-hmm. Um. It, it has such a Dune vibe to mm-hmm. it, like because it's all like grim and uh, it's just dirty and there's just broken everything. Yeah, the whole space in between LA and San Diego, which is like a, a two hour drive or close to, it's just a dump. is a garbage dump. 
Yeah, oh, I love it. It's it's, it's, so, uh, it's so horrible though. Like it's such a dystopia. It's so post-apocalyptic, and you can just looking down at that, you just can imagine people living in there like Tuscan Raiders. Uh huh. Oh, and basically that is who lives down there yeah. because when they see a cop car flying over, they start shooting at it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, uh uh-uh, no cops out here. <laughs> like, good luck getting to San Diego, dog. And and they <laughs> and they start shooting at him and. Um, he's sort of taken aback by it. What? What? And then, like, they crash his spinner. They hit him with, like, a little EMP and shut it down. Yeah, I like how they did that. They shot him with a spear that hits his car, and then it deploys a kite Mm -hmm. with metal spars, and there's a cable. Yeah. And it gets hit by lightning, and it fries his car's system yeah. and he goes down it was yeah. like wow that's some that's some ben franklin shit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's why you, no one goes to no one goes to san diego anymore at least not that that way nope um yeah and he crashes and uh it gets pretty hairy for a second like he starts taking fire from the trash towers and yeah and they they basically they go and saw him out of the car and he gets out and he's uh he's just and joy, he's he's serving up joy people. is trying to wake him up and yeah. stuff and then he starts fighting them and he's yeah. kicking their asses but there's a lot of them yeah it's like a zombie thing like if they're fast zombies uh-huh. you know you can kill a zombie one on one but can you kill 50 on one right yeah, he's uh, a regular baseline human is no match for a Nexus 9, but like no. can a, a whole junkyard community can maybe take him. Especially with their crazy like MacGyver guns and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but then they start getting like, uh, you know, like low orbit missiles fired yeah, on Yeah, like somebody called for fire. Like he's just getting uh, like all of these uh, uh, like... Like you said, missiles are something. To me, it felt like mortars, yeah. uh, like mortar fire. I know when I was in the military, we had uh, fi- uh, f- um, a Ford Observer with us at all times, and they can call for fire, and then you just get long-range artillery, just boom, 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 wherever they call the coordinates in, and that's exactly what it felt like. Yeah. And then, of course, they're shit bird call for fire ends up hitting too close and like knocks <laughs> him too <laughs> yeah but and he's a nexus nine and we we cut over it's love she's like chilling on the couch she's just, getting a manicure yeah she's get, like a digital manicure while he's he's putting images on mm-hmm. her fingernails and she's like calling in the coordinates and and shooting these guys and then she zooms in on k and she's like come on get up you know yeah uh, and he looks up and he sees like the 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 sort of blinking light of the satellite or whatever up above and yeah. is like who the hell's that what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah and so he gets the he gets the spinner kind of back online turns turns his drone on and ha- tells it to watch the car and he goes over to the orphanage which is in it's like, like a, this gnarly kind of like thunderdome looking thing <laughs> yeah totally um and he he goes in he sees mr cotton uh played by lenny james from the walking dead and he's basically got the kids disassembling electronics to pull the rare earth minerals out of them he it's like a catalytic converter yeah uh, like because and this is i mean this is how like in many third world countries like is in especially in south asia these sort of kids who go through junkyards and pull the cadmium and stuff out of yeah. out of thrown away electronics? This is a real thing happening in, in 2022, not not 2049. Yeah, he's just a total slave master. Oh yeah, it's it's pretty chilling, honestly. And he basic because K comes in to ask him about a kid. And he thinks he's there to buy it. Yeah, kid. he instantly goes into salesman. Yeah, he 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 blows a whistle and he has the kids stand up and he's like, kind of, what kind of kid are you interested in? And it's like, oh, just the the implications are dark. See, he could he he could have bought one of them. He didn't have to have joy. He could have had <laughs> he a, could have a real a companion. <laughs> People would have an issue with him (laughs) coming home with a human child. He's like, I bought him fair and square in San Diego, the lawless zone of San Diego. Now he lives in this nice apartment, not out in Thunderdome. (laughs) (laughs) And now I can talk to a real kid. (laughs) Yeah. And it's um, once uh, Cotton figures out that he's a cop, he he gets real tight-lipped and doesn't want to talk. And uh, Kay just bashes him in the nose. And he's like, I think you have really detailed records yeah um and so 
you know, it just it took one punch to to get him to take him back to the file room. Yeah, I I mean, K is very is very um persuasive <laughs> when it comes. He's just he's just brutal. He's, he's very mild-mannered, but like everyone knows uh a Nexus 9 replicants, uh, a force to be reckoned with, right? Yeah. Like it's not anything to trifle with. Um and he goes back there and he he gets out the record book and uh the pages they're the, just totally torn out they're totally torn out and he freaks for the he, whole year he's like i didn't do this it wasn't me this is before me like and he freaks out and he runs off um and k he just keeps getting distracted since he's been in here yeah, he's because like going into like memory uh memory fog mode he's yeah. like wandering around and he goes and, and we basically we watch him go through the things we saw from the childhood memory yeah. all the way, all the way down to the furnace. And, you know, he stop he stands there for a second in front of the furnace and we talk about letting, letting a moment linger for a second. Yeah. He doesn't just immediately open it. Like he stands there and has a think about what does it mean if I open this and the horse is in there? Yes. And he opens it and the horse is in there. So that's a real memory. Uh, yeah, and I like how when he is walking down and all this, it's just, I mean, there's a soundscape, mm-hmm. there's sound design going on, yeah. but there's no dialogue, there's no chatter. They just let the scenes breathe. Yeah. And it feels it feels heavy as mm-hmm. a result. Yeah, it builds tension. Um, and uh, so to talk a little bit, like, so Roger Deakins designs the lighting for this whole movie. Yeah. Um, whereas Ridley Scott's Blade Runner is all noir all the time. Yeah. Deacon's most of the time is a realistic lighting guy, right? Like most things, um, especially outdoors and in like brightly lit places are, are not shadowy at all. So when we go into a heavy shadow environment, it means something, right? Like it's, it's, we're going down into the belly of the beast as he as he goes down there, like yeah, and it feels heavier because he doesn't always use that dark lighting. I mean, it really reminds me of the of Dune mm-hmm. lighting. I don't know if yeah. it's same, it's not the same guy. It's just uh, similar though. Yeah, um, yeah, and and so Joy, his AI girlfriend, is basically telling him like, okay, because replicant artifi- memories are artificial but you found this evidence that means you were born. You weren't created. So you're Rachel's child. You're Rachel's child. And she says, you should have a name. And she starts calling him Joe. Joe. Yeah. And he's like, stop calling me that. Yeah. And so he's like, he's still suspicious about it. And she says, well, you should go and talk to the, the expert on implanted memories. And so he goes to see uh, Dr. Anna Anna, uh, Staline played by, Carla Yuri and mm-hmm. she's building a memory when he when he gets there. Yeah, she's in like this lush jungle scene yeah. with this bug and a super high tech kind of camera thing. Yeah. And it's and it kind of reveals to be like almost a holodeck. Yeah, yeah. She's in like a dome. Yeah. Like a hologram dome, and she's then she like has a like a little device girl. that, yeah, that looks it looks like <laughs> Polly Shore should be <laughs> the biodome. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know, like she sees Kay is there, and she shuts down the hologram. She goes over to talk to him, and she she says she's in the dome because she has a compromised immune system. Uh, and when her parents uh, her parents left for the off world colonies, and she couldn't come along because of her susceptibility to disease. So why'd they leave? Really? Yeah, that seems fucked. Well, Sorry, yeah. kid, we're gonna leave you in a bubble. <laughs> <laughs> it does seem fucked. I mean, I don't, we're going to spoil it right now. It's also not true. Yeah, it's also a lie. <laughs> it's also a lie, yeah. Um, but it's a plausible enough story because that's true to the... You You have to be in, in sort of perfect health to go to the off-world colonies. Sure. Because um, so, you can't be going there to compromise the... Uh, the health of the, of the population. Sure. Um, so basically, her parents left her behind... But she could have her perfect little bubble world that's like her her prison and her and her shelter at the same time. I'd live in a holodeck. That'd be pretty cool. 
Yeah, it would get lonely, I think. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You'd she... want, you, you could just import yourself a joy. You... <laughs> a little AI girlfriend. I mean, it seems like it seems like Kay you get sported no. for all the expansion packs, including the tinfoil hat. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He did. So, Kinda yeah. all the personality sub-modules. And, and she, she's the person that makes artificial memories. She could just, yeah. She could whip one up. She can just entertain herself. So she's a con- we, we learned she's a contractor for Wallace. Yeah. She's like a freelancer. She doesn't work directly for him because she wants the freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so he wants to know how, how you can know if a, if a memory is, is real. And while, while he's talking, she's, you know, she's working, she's building like a birthday party memory for a kid. Um, and she, she has him come over and basically look in a viewfinder and she has him think of the memory so she can, uh, look at it. Yeah. Uh, and he thinks about, you know, the, the child, the childhood memory with the, with the toy horse and everything. Yeah. And he's what, and you can see sort of the pain on his face and she's getting emotional watching it. She's kind of, she's kind of tear. She's rolling tears a little bit. And then she goes, uh, someone lived this. This is a real memory. Yeah. And, um, he freaks out for the first time. He like, (laughs) he loses it. Like he screams and he like, uh, like smacks a chair and he, he freaks out. Um, and he goes outside and the, the cops are waiting for him because he mm-hmm. hasn't, he's off the reservation right now. He's freelancing. And I wanted to point out that at this point, like I just, like when he showed up to talk to the doctor, uh-huh. uh, Stelline, it's no longer in the movie. It's no longer raining all the time. It's now snowing all the time, yeah. and I definitely think that's intentional. It's a it, we've 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 moved past uh, the first act, uh-huh. and we're uh, this this change of scenery is really striking when you he goes yeah. outside because it's this austere building, mm-hmm. and there's the car, and it's got snow on it, and the ground is patched with snow and pavement, yeah, and it's just inherently brighter yeah. than previous. Like, and I, I don't know if I'm stretching here, but I kind of feel like it's brighter like his perceptions have heightened in yeah. general. His eyes are now open. So since you bring this up, the the moment when he finds the horse is dead mental or dead middle in the runtime. Okay. It's the it's the turning point of the movie and it's the the very center of it. Um so yeah, so you're right. We're out we're out of that the first act and we're in the the middle of the second act essentially or um the second act's not as long. No. Um the it, third act's really the longest. Act. Yeah, I don't think he's in. I don't think he's in L.A. anymore when he's when he goes to see her. I think yeah. he's, he's up in the in the mountains or whatever, which is why they come looking for him because. What the fuck are you doing? What are you, you went to San Diego and now you're up in Aspen or whatever? You know, like you're all over the place. What are you doing? Um, and they take him in for for base. Oh, but I was gonna say it's it's. Going to the mountaintop to see the sage, right? Yeah, like yeah. he he's gone to the mountaintop, to, like in Skyrim when you yeah. go to the... <laughs> <laughs> to get wisdom from the from the wise one up there on the mountain. Yeah, um, they bring him in for baseline, and he's way off baseline. Yeah, yeah, he can't he can't keep up with the thing. He's getting more frantic. He's shook. He goes in to talk to Joshi, and she's like, "You're off the reservation. What are you even doing?" And he tells her what she wants to hear. He's yeah, like, he's like, I killed the child. Yeah, he's that's like, why I'm freaking yeah, out. Yeah, basically, it's done. What you wanted me to do, I did it. And she's like, oh, good job. She's like, well, I'll help you get out of the building, but uh, you need to. You have 48 hours, and if you don't have your shit together by your next baseline test, they're gonna kill you. Yeah, and that's that's his great reward for uh, for this uh, thing that he he's saying that he did, which he didn't do. But he definitely didn't want to kill this kid. No. Um, and all the reward he would get is sort of like a forty-eight hour pardon. Yeah, and he so he has to surrender his badge and his gun, and he leaves the station. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, then he goes back to his apartment, and yeah. uh, turns out Joy, Joy hires Marietta, uh-huh. and uh, the the sex worker replicant uh i i didn't realize she was a replicant at first uh, yeah. but i guess she is and they kind of do like a meld like a, she's a surrogate yeah basically because joy you can't touch her because she's a, a hologram and so she overlays with mariette and they have a they have a 
a weird sort of holographic threesome thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's a good scene. It's a little uncomfortable. It's a little. It's a little weird. Yeah. It's like yeah. It's right on the line between creepy and sexy. And it and <laughs> st- it's it goes on both sides of it at different points. So divers, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, what are you talking about? That was straight up sexy. You're the creep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you the, you, I, you live on that side of the line. <laughs> And so Mariette puts a tracker in Kay's jacket pocket. Yeah, she s- slides at that the in the end of it all. And uh-huh. then Joy's basically like, "You can get the fuck out of here." Yeah, because <laughs> Joy's done with your ass. Joy's jealous of her, and it's really um, Mariette says it's the hardest burn on Joy, where she's like, "I've been inside you. There's not as much there as you think." <laughs> and it's like, oh, like it's true. Like it's a true observation. Um, yeah, listen but, here, chat bot. <laughs> yeah, but ouch, like uncalled for. <laughs> yeah, but you know, Joy should have been a little more chill. Yeah, she should have been a lot nicer. Like, yeah. thank her for her work, etc. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, um, I really appreciate what you did, and da 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 da. But instead, she decided to be jealous and a little shitty, and so she got she got a sick burn as a, <laughs> as a reward. Yeah. So uh, then Joy asks Kay to transfer her completely to the mobile emitter yeah that way she's got no files left there at the home holograph uh like holographic projector or whatever yeah. so that if they come and raid his apartment uh there'll be nothing there for of her yeah and reluctantly he does this because because this means there's no cloud backup yeah of when they break that antenna um and to her like he says that means you know you could die and she's like like a real girl like that means like it's a point of pride to her like that yeah. sort of like you're not human unless you have something to lose unless you can die yeah and when he breaks the antenna it instantly alerts love yeah because she's tracking him all the time yeah she's been using this shit. yeah because it's like she's like super stalker well she he's got the whole wallace home suite right oh, yeah. so it's like i mean he's a wallace product yeah <laughs> so she knows everything and he shuts that off and she's like oh that's not good that's how I pay attention to him. That's how I always. That's he'll get killed by San Diego Raiders if I, <laughs> if, I, if I don't have joy to track him with. So um, then he like heads down to the market, mm-hmm. uh, like and and he he hands over the horse, the toy mm-hmm. horse, to be analyzed by the by this dude, Doctor Badger. And Doctor Badger is the Somali pirate from yeah. from that one movie, Barkhad Abdi. All of those memes, yeah. Like, I'm the, the captain. Look now. at me, I'm the captain now. Yeah. Um and the um and basically like the only place that's that dirty with that much radioactivity and stuff is Vegas. Yeah. So do you think? The bomb, the the blackout day bomb that went off actually went off over Vegas. Uh, maybe. I mean, because that's like it a, wouldn't have been a hundred miles from Los Angeles. About like it would have had to have been a not very dirty bomb if it was over Vegas. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, because so, why is Vegas un or supposedly uninhabitable when they get there? The well, radio I mean, is just straight up desert and in the future like yeah. even those coastal areas are desert yeah but it's um uh but it's something happened there that made it radioactive to why it was abandoned yeah um it's not lived in anymore um but mm-hmm. the, he finds when he's scanning it he finds the radiation levels have gone to normal yeah. which is probably it's high normal, for us but yeah. normal for them um and he sees a heat signature and so he, he goes in and, and he's looking at all these crazy landmarks and there's this uh i mean there's all these just gigantic statues of naked ladies and yeah it's just there's like some recognizable hotels and there's a lot of yeah. future hotels too mm-hmm. and uh, definitely things that i don't think are currently in las vegas yeah like he he leaves his police cruiser parked mm-hmm. outside of vegas and just walks in yeah um kind of like walking up the strip like yeah. he's he's coming in at the at the one end of the strip and he's just walking in um and, and it's a pretty and, cool it's a cool visual of him walking into the dust storm and it's another time where we it's one of the uh, kind of a long sequence in the movie where we're outside of realistic lighting right mm-hmm. we're, we're into expressionist lighting everything is orange in vegas it's like there's just a haze sort of like 
in the West Coast these last few years, we've had really bad wildfires. Yeah. We've had days that looked like this. Oh, for sure. So it's there's so much haze in the sky that all the light uh, from the sun that's coming through is just filtered down as orange over everything. Yeah. Um, and he walks up and there's a bunch of beehives. Like, yeah. just, just like, you know, like what you see, like a beekeeper's beehives and um, everything is all animal life in the future basically is supposed to be dead. Mostly dead, yeah. Yeah, so this is remarkable to find mm-hmm. to find these bees. bees. And Kay, of course, uh, he's a replicant with not, he doesn't have like the same sort of human instinctual responses. Sticks his hand in the beehive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, it's all covered in bees and he's just kind of looking at it baffled. Yeah. Uh, it seemed like an interesting kind of a weird scene, but I think it, it kind of showed it, it, it added to the bizarre nature of walking into the, yeah. into Vegas. Yeah. And there's some, uh, as long as this movie is, there is things from the screenplay that are cut out yeah. and, and there's a, there's a lot more made of how Deckard is farming food and stuff yeah. in, in the screenplay. And the bees are just part of the operation. Um, but the, the rest of it, like his hydroponic grow labs and everything like it's cut. It's not necessary to the, to the story. Yeah. The bees are the evocative image. And so that's, that part stayed, but I was always like, there has to be flowers. If you have bees, you have to have flowers. There are flowers. We just don't see the flowers. Yeah. Um, so he goes into this, uh, well, it, it, before that it cuts over, uh, mm-hmm. to love going oh. into Joshi's office or Joshi's office. Oh, right. Yeah. Cause we, we kind of get cut from him as he's walking into the town and, um, and then it seems like these two know each other. It seems like Love and Joshi have met for some oh, reason. Oh, I think um, Joshi saw the security camera footage of, yeah. of Love stealing the bones. Because she says something about, she's like, basically, he already did it. He killed the kid. So all you have is the bones that you stole. And basically, yeah. like, even if you kill me, you're screwed, lady. Yeah, so it's already over. Whatever. And, um, and Love, ki- like totally terminators her like he crush, yeah. crushes her hand with the the glass in it yeah and, that's pretty gnarly and, and love kind of sheds a tear like as she's doing this because well because she's also going off the reservation a little bit because she uh joshi says something to her about how she can't lie and she's like i can't lie i'm gonna tell wallace that you tried to shoot me and that's why i had to kill you Yes, and so it's like she's also pushing her programming in, yeah. in the in the course of this this uh, this mystery that they're that they're trying to solve. And the cool little stiletto that she pulls out mm-hmm. and then kills uh, Joshi with that is a that was a custom knife that they had made for that character, and mm-hmm. they had him made in steel so that she could like open it and be sneak. And the prop guy was like, "Yeah, it's metal. It's real because even though we could paint." a plastic one or a 3d printed one up mm-hmm. it wouldn't it wouldn't read as metal even as a, a perfect paint job it's not going to be yeah perfect to your eye so they right. use real metal yeah and then only when they have her shank her with the with the rubber uh rubber prop do they, yeah. they switch it at the last second that's cool and they also do um when she stabs her don't they they cut to outside the window mm-hmm. so you don't hear the the stab you just see it yeah and then you cut back inside when she gets on the computer to pull up Kay's location and she just unceremoniously picks up Robin Wright's head and it holds it, it up, up to the scanner yeah. and then drops it and her head hits the table so hard <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like you, in the theater everyone goes oh That's like ice like, cold <laughs> like there's certain hits um, there's a lot of like blunt force trauma to heads in this movie, yeah, yeah. and they all f- feel real <laughs> like when you see them. Uh, anyways, back in Las Vegas, Kay goes in to a uh, abandoned casino, and there's trip wires and and stuff. And he's someone's obviously living in here, and he's just sort of creeping around. And uh, Harrison Ford comes out of the shadow with a gun to the back of Kay's head. Yeah. And he says something. Oh, oh, first Kay sees the dog. Yeah, he sees the dog. And then, so he's looking that way. And then it's a distraction. And mm-hmm. then Harrison Ford Deckard comes out uh, holding the gun. And real animals, again, uh, in this time period, 
really don't exist. So yeah. seeing a dog is remarkable. Yes. Um, and yeah, Deckard's behind him and, and he says something like, it's a quote from, from Treasure Island where he's like, he says, you wouldn't have happen to have a piece of cheese on you, would you boy? And um, Kay recognizes the quote and, and he's like, oh, it can read. <laughs> like he's, uh, he's sort of halfway impressed that the, the Blade Runner uh, reads books. Yeah, but Deckard himself a Blade Runner. So he, <laughs> he should know. He shouldn't yeah. be so shitty. Yeah, we're all readers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so they have like a little interchange, and um, Kay's like, "I'm not here to take you in. You know, I'm I'm just here to ask some questions." Yeah. And Deckard's not buying it. He thinks he's there to be retired, right? Rightly so. He, yeah, yeah. He hasn't stayed alive this long by n- not suspecting everyone that comes up to talk to him. And he goes to shoot him, and Kay uh, does a header off the balcony to get away. Yeah, he bails. They have kind of a a, a, a running fight where uh, Deckard is shooting at him, mm-hmm. and then and then he turns the power on, and we have a holographic intermittent show with like Elvis. And- yeah, Suspicious Minds is a song that's got to be on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> the, um, yeah. The and it's a. Uh, Deck, he's K sets off some of the booby traps, um, but you know survives everything, and eventually they get into a fist fight. Yeah, and uh, K just lets him keep punching him because yeah. I mean it's pretty clear K could destroy Deckard in a fist fight. Oh yeah, this old man doesn't have a chance. He just lets him punch him until he literally is like punched himself out. Yeah, and it's like um, he says, "I'm trying not to hurt you, but you're making it really hard," or, so, yeah. or something like that. Um, and they stop. Because uh, it switches from suspicious minds to uh, I can't help falling in love with you. Mm-hmm. And Deckard's like, ah, I like this song. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, we could keep doing this or how about we get a drink? And he's like, yeah. I'll take the drink. And um, Harrison Ford really socked the shit out of, of Ryan Gosling when they were filming this oh, scene. Oh, did he? Yeah. So it's like some of those some of those punches like where there's good spit particles and stuff that come off, those ones connected. Oh, man. <laughs> and I th- Indiana Jones can still throw a pretty good punch, <laughs> yeah. I think. <laughs> they look like they'd hurt. Um, yeah, so they go to the bar and, you know, Deckard's like, you know, I hope you like whiskey. We've got millions of bottles of whiskey. Yeah, I thought that was hilarious. And then he pours some out for the dog and the dog starts drinking it. So... Don't give whiskey to your dogs. It's cute in a movie, but don't do yeah, it. Yeah. So, w- would you want a replicant dog? Um, seems like it'd be pretty awesome. I think it would be pretty awesome. Um, the dogs don't know that they're replicants. Yeah. Because she's gonna lot, have perfect health. Because some not always know. Because again, the in the books, the, in Do Androids Dream of Electric mm-hmm. Sheep, uh, the electric animal repair guy is a thing right because that's what um, oh yeah that's true that's what uh what's his name from the movie from, from blade runner was. yeah yeah that, that's what he does is repair electric animals yeah um so they break down and stuff like so i guess maybe it wouldn't be perfect it wouldn't be perfect but semi-eternal as long as, you cool, do, yeah. as long as you do the maintenance um yeah, mostly I think it's a probably it's probably a good thing, and you can feed them whiskey apparently. Yeah, if you do anything <laughs> at all. and they they do fine on it. Which actually, Kay asks him. He's like, "Is it real?" He says, "I don't know." Ask him. Why don't you ask him? Yeah, he says, "You got a name?" And, he's, and he gives him his serial name. He's like, "It's not a name. It's a serial number." And so he this is the first time he calls himself Joe. Yeah, I thought that was cool. Yeah, he's becoming a real boy, like we said, um, and he's. He's you gotta remember he's thinking he's that this is his dad. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. basically this whole time he's like, This is dad. He's coming here and he's like, This guy, this is I am his loin fruit. I do the same job that he did. He abandoned me. Like, I need answers. Like he's yeah. want he's he's out here and like you can't quite tell if Deckard's quite living up to what he wants him to be or not. Mm-hmm. Cause he does seem impressed with, with this old man, like, yeah. And, and how he's living. Uh, and he, he presses him to explain like, why, why, why did you, why did you leave your family? Why did you, you've never seen your kid. You left Rachel who you loved. And he's like, cause that was the plan. We were being hunted. I didn't want, I didn't want our child to die. Yeah, and basically he wanted to not know where she was at so that if 
he got caught, they couldn't wring the information from him. Yeah. And he explained to the other replicants how to tamper with the birth records. So the whole microfish thing. That yeah, was, that's, that's why his... there was both a ma- male and a female yeah. of the same thing. Because he was just leaving. He was leaving uh, confusion in the wake. Yeah. And so, you know, like they kind of kind of have a break, right? Like yeah. Kay goes and catches a nap and like they sort of like take a moment to, to think about all of this stuff, um, which is when uh, bad they, guys arrive. They realize that someone has tracked him here, basically. Yeah. Um, and so they, they make a run for, <laughs> they make a run for, for Deckard's spinner. He still got the one from the original movie. Yeah. It's pretty um, rad looking. And, uh, he shuts the door behind him and Kay just busts through the wall. I love the full Kool-Aid man. <laughs> Yeah, you can't. He, he's he, he's a force to be reckoned with. You can't just shut him out. Yeah, and um, and they blow up the spinner before they can get yeah, to it. Yeah, it hits it right with yeah. some missiles, and yeah. then the other car just flies in and parks in the room. Real slick too. And that the, was a real yeah. good parking job. And these dudes with respirators get out, mm-hmm. and uh, then lo- then uh, Love shows up at, to kick Kay's ass after he ki- he took out the thugs. Mm-hmm. And uh, they kidnap J- Deckard. She stomps on Joy's emitter, Ooh. and they leave Kay to die. Yeah. So, and Joy, Joy dies pleading for for Kay's life, and then she says she loves him. Yeah, it's her last words. Yeah, it's pretty good chatbot programming. <laughs> you know, it's you know what it makes me think of is like um, the companions in like Fallout. And thing oh, like yeah, for thing sure. like thing like that, you know, like you 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 build a pretty decent relationship with some of those some More of those like NPCs and Red Dead your horses. Fuck that horse, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Samwise, my horse is is even even more than than my wife in fallout <laughs> Samwise, <laughs> my horse for Red Dead still hurts, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, I would tear for joy because even though she's just an ai she really she really was a ride or die for him yeah for sure sign um, me up oof and uh so they use uh basically like they the freedom we cut to the uh replicant freedom movement yeah who, they come like show up using mariette's tracker the sex worker who planted it in his pocket and you probably forgot about that Mm -hmm. from an hour ago or you were confused about who she was working for and thought maybe she was working for love Um, no she's she's a freedom fighter and they show up to rescue k he comes to consciousness near a campfire he's all twitchy and fucked up and so he kind of goes back to sleep again yeah um and um so everyone always wonders what happens about with the dog the yeah. dog also gets rescued. It's a deleted scene that the dog is there with them oh. later. So uh, the interview with uh, Villeneuve I was watching earlier, they asked him about it. And he's like, my take is the dog lives. Actually, there is a scene where you see the dog around, but uh, it was cut for time. <laughs> and so, I looked up what kind of dog that was. It's like a mount- some sort of eastern european mountain dog like huh. they're really like cool. a caucasian shepherd or something. kind of yeah it wasn't that it was like a really obscure kind of dog but that's pretty you know whatever I'm not it's gonna a, get one seems of, like a good dog yeah and he said the dog was a really good actor because he wanted a dog uh that seemed like it was an old machine yeah and so it moved slow and didn't bark um and that's yeah, perfect the dog delivered yeah um so basically he wakes up mariette you know kind of explains what is going on that he's with the this replicant freedom movement and introduces uh him to the leader uh Freysia, uh played by Haim Abbas and she says she was there when Rachel died in childbirth and you know basically how much that meant to her and Sapper and the people who were involved it meant that you know they could produce life and, yeah um you know that they were they were something more than slaves it was it was something miraculous um and as she goes on to you know explain their movement and the and the blackout and why they did that and everything she just sort of mentions you know i was there i held i held the child and i saw her and like it kind of comes out He's like her her yeah and it's like you know that the child was a girl 
and she realizes he has that that memory implanted yeah. yeah and so he's like you you thought it was you you thought you were the baby and and he's like he's he's you know his world's kind of falling apart on him i kind of love this moment because oh, it, it hurts man. it takes the the uh it takes the golden child trope like i'm the chosen one mm-hmm. blah 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 the special it, boy it's special boy and it just turns it inside out and tosses it in the garbage it's just like you're not the special boy. You are just another fucking machine. Yeah. But, um, well, she says, everyone here. We all everyone, thought we did, were. And everyone wishes they were that child. Yeah. Um, and also, to die for the, she gives him that idea that to die for the righteous cause is the most human you can, most human thing you can That's do. That's a pretty radical way of thinking. Yeah, but it's about uh, freedom of choice, right? Like, choose, he, Right now, or up until now, he hasn't had any choice in, in what he was doing with his life. So That's choosing true. what you die for is the ultimate freedom in that way. I mean, choosing what you live for is yeah, probably was, a better one. I was going to say, I'm pretty <laughs> sure Gandhi has a lot of other things to say. Like, and there's other people have, that have different ideas yeah, about that. about, you know, what freedom looks like and absolutely controlling yourself as opposed to, oh, just dying in violent conflict because you chose to. <laughs> that's definitely the ultimate freedom. How American of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess that's true. I just say it's my ideology. <laughs> it's, it's the ideology. It's Frasia. She's yeah. a radical. She is a radical. And she's, I mean, it's just that understanding, you know, not all of them are going to make it to get what their, sure. what their goal is. Sure. Um, it's not like you want to die for the cause, but you're willing to die for the cause. Um, anyways, Kay, he thinks back on all of this stuff and that's when he realizes that Dr. Anna was, is the girl. Yeah. She made the, it's her memory and she implants it in them. And She's Rachel and Deckard's daughter. Yeah. And Frasia tells uh, Kay that he needs to kill Deckard mm-hmm. for all the replicants greater good. Yeah. How do they know the magic was in Rachel and not in Deckard? Did they uh, test it out? Did they no. have him fuck a bunch of replicants to see if they had babies? <laughs> I don't think so. If they haven't, I, I mean, why kill Deckard at this point? Oh, just because of what he can reveal, I think. It's not... She can reveal the same. Does she kill herself? She's still fighting for the cause. Deckard's captured. This is some sus logic. It is. He's, you know, they're radicals, man. They're I th- terrorists. I, yeah, I think Frasia is a bad, is a toxic influence. Well, let's let's see where this goes. <laughs> um and so Kay goes back to Los Angeles, um, and he gets the next kind of gut punch as he's kind of going to get a gun mm-hmm. and everything. Is he gets hit up by the giant ad for joy, and yes. so we get the the nude, black eyed, um, pink skin, blue hair. Yeah, the sort of the full on sex bot version of joy. And yeah. she starts giving him the sales pitch about, you know, wanting, to, wanting the companion. And she says, you look like a real good Joe. And, oh. and he has that, that realization that the only relationship that he's had in his whole life wasn't even really real because she's just a, a, a programmed AI that told she him what he wanted to hear. everybody Joe. Yeah. All of the Johns are Joes. All the Johns are Joes. Oh, and that's like a better name and he's for like the he's, episode all of the johns are jokes <laughs> <laughs> that is funny right? um and he's standing there in the rain and he's he's beat up he's got the head wound his green jacket is basically black with filth his blonde hair is black with blood and and filth yeah he's gnarly and he's standing in the rain and the blood's running down and it's like and He's totally broken. Right? Hashtag freedom. Yeah, at this point, <laughs> <laughs> he's gone too far. He's gone to the not. not he the is d- too free at this point. <laughs> in the the nothing, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. <laughs> Fully free. <laughs> <laughs> he's lost. He's lost his job. His his chat bot. <laughs> His idea that he was the Harry Potter of the story. Oh, man. That's the worst thing to lose is that he is a golden boy. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, you mean I'm not special? He's not special. But what he can do, though, um, 
is at least still save the day. But he still has a life to throw away. He still has a life to throw away. <laughs> <laughs> so we cut over uh, to Wallace, who is uh, putting the question to Deckard. Yes. And Wallace is doing some grade A head fuckery on Deckard because he's, he says, he basically comes at Deckard with the, didn't you ever think maybe you were programmed to fall in love with her or des- designed to fall in love with her? Yeah. And, and Deckard's like, you know, almost at that, like, is this guy about to tell me that I'm a replicant? And then Wallace kind of goes back. That is if you were designed at all. And like, <laughs> and he's like, and so he like blue balls him on the reveal. Like, he's like, I know, I know if you were designed but it's more fun for me if you don't know. Yeah, I prefer it this way. <laughs> I prefer it this way. And he basically, in exchange for the information, he produces a new Rachel. Mm-hmm. Um, and we get a really great uh, de-aged uh, Sean Young come in as Rachel. And she's wearing the outfit from the first movie. And she walks up and, and she talks to Deckard. And he looks shook. And then he just offhandedly goes, her eyes were green. And and turns and walks off and love shoots her in the head and he winces like, and it's like good. Harrison Ford doesn't always do good acting. Like he does a lot. (laughs) He does a lot of movie star, like playing Harrison Ford and kind of overdoing it. He does some really good acting. Yeah, it was it was pretty good. I was interested in how they accomplished having the Rachel clone. And yeah, they had her in there with um, with dots on her face mm-hmm. and actually do the scene, and then they just in post CGI'd the face in. Yeah, they shot it. They shot it with a, a young actor yeah. in costume that was the same dimensions basically yeah. as Sean Young. Then that's who everyone's acting against. With Sean Young, they're directing with Denis Villeneuve. And then they mocap Sean Young and combined yeah, the performances. Yeah, and combined it in. I think yeah. that's pretty cool how they sorted that out. It is, and that's usually like that's the way they kind of do it in Marvel movies and stuff. Is that too. how they did? Um, uh, that's probably how they did Mark Hamill when he came back as Luke Skywalker. Yeah, totally. They do. They they shoot it. They shoot it with the young actor. They shoot it with the old actor, and match re- it up. And they match it up where the the old actor isn't used as much as it's informing the digital artist. Sure. Because because as you get older, most people kind of spread out and get thicker. And what? Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> not every not Harrison Ford though. Like, <laughs> oh, the, I mean, he doesn't look like early on Han Solo. He, he doesn't, looks but a he's lot bigger. But he's still skinny because um, if you watch, you have to watch the trailer for the new Indiana Jones mm. because de aging Harrison Ford looks easier than de aging some people. Sure. Um, just because he's not, he didn't get chubby. Well, he keeps working out. Yeah. yeah. Um. So anyways, they've got superior ways of torture that they can do off world. So they're going to they're going to take his ass to Mars and really put him under the screws. Um I wonder why Mars. Like why can't they just do it there in the pyramid? Uh, cuz there's laws, man. And Who cares it, about laws? Wallace cares about laws. We live in a world with built on a wall. <laughs> 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 yeah, for whatever reason, they need to take him off world to really torture the sure, <laughs> torture sure. the information out of him. So they're they're flying to LAX uh, to get to get Deckard off world, mm-hmm. um, and that's another this is another clue for Deckard being a replicant because uh, he asks Love where they're going and she says that we're going home. Yes, and so it's like kind of like you're we're both out of the same factory. Potentially, potentially, it means something like that. Yeah. Um, this is when Kay flies in like Han Solo and starts blasting cars. Like he shoots down the two support spinners that are accompanying them, and then uh, basically makes them crash the the limo that they're in. Yeah, I really like the lighting and the sound design in this. It mm-hmm. made it feel like it made the crash down feel real yeah. with the surf of the ocean and the sound and everything. Yeah. Awesome. And that's another thing. Um, my, one of my big takeaways from the theatrical experience was the sound design of this movie. It is so uh, immersive and at times really uncomfortable with the loud, like the um, Hans Zimmer score. Hans Zimmer, yeah. Hans Zimmer is not a very like, musical composer he's much he's uh like he describes it as being right up to the edge of sound design himself like he's using tones to elicit feelings more than he's composing uh songs 
Of course. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so they crash. Um, they're sort of like up against that seawall that you were talking about yeah. earlier because they were coming in too low, probably trying to fly, fly below radar. Something like that. And um, the car is sort of slowly sliding into the sea um, with Deckard handcuffed inside. And love uh, and care having a fight on the beach. Yeah. And, and they have a pretty brutal uh fight. And she kicks his ass. Like Yeah. I mean, she's she's whooping his ass and it's just it's an awesome scene because like uh Deckard is just gonna he's just gonna die. He's gonna and slowly die. He can't that. figure this shit out. Mm-hmm. Um because he's he's cuffed in there and uh it, it's just it's just a really gnarly scene, and then so it looks like love wins, and so she goes back to the oh, car, she kisses him oh, yeah. <laughs> before she walks away, which is funny, and then she says, "I was the best one." Like this whole thing was just to get the cookie of being the best replicant, yeah, to her. Um, and I like how when she goes into the car and she's going for uh, Deckard. Uh, K comes up like a shark from uh-huh. under her. It's totally Jaws. He does come from under the water um, and then puts her under the water. Yeah. And, and, and he just, just holds her. And he, she's the thing I love about this part because drowning is brutal, mm-hmm. but the sound, like you hear oh, yeah. her screaming through the water. It's so, uh, it's just amazing acting and the sound design is just so crazy. It's very visceral, uncomfortable yes. because he's like sort of dead eyed holding her under the water with one hand on the, on the ceiling, like pushing of the, her of the car and holding her down just until she goes limp. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Deckard is watching the whole thing, like kind of like he's watching two Terminators fight, you know, and he's he kind of is. And he, yeah. And he's like, Oh, what's even happening? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> he just looks totally freaked out by the whole thing. Um, and then, uh, you know, she goes limp. He breaks Deckard's restraints off. They get him out and they go to the, you know, to the spinner. And Deckard says, you should, you should have let me die. And he's like, ah, uh, you, you did, did die. die. You did die. You died in that car crash. Uh, he's like, now you can go see your daughter. Yeah, and he takes her to the office, and uh, he's like, "Like he's like, are you okay?" And he's like, "Yeah." Yeah. And he lays down on the steps. <laughs> yeah, and, and he goes, basically dies. Yeah, he because Deckard's like, "Like, why did you do? Who who am I to you?" And he goes, "Just go see your daughter." And he sits down there, um, and we don't we don't actually see the reunion of Deckard and his daughter, or not not even the reunion. It's literally the first time he meets her. Yeah. So we don't see any of that. We just sit there with Kay. Um, Vangelis's Tears in the Rain from the original Blade Runner starts playing because time to die, basically. Yeah. Kay just sits down there and, and, and bleeds out because he's, he's stabbed all the shit. Oh, yeah. He got he's, fucked up. Yeah. He, she, uh, Love, stabbed him a lot. Yeah. Um, and he just, he just dies a free man out there on the steps. And roll credits. There's no no... No postscript, no mid credit stinger. We don't know what happened, uh, but Kay's journey is complete. This was Kay's story. Yeah, it's, and we saw it all the way to the end. I really liked. Uh, I really liked that how it just kind of he just dies in the mm-hmm. snow. It's really striking. It is. It's. It's just. I mean, it's like. Uh, it's like Rucker Howard's Roy Batty's death in oh, the original. Yeah. It's like. Um, it's sad. It's it's sad when when they die because he is fully human. Like he's he's living. He's he sacrificed himself. Like by the standards that they set to die for the yeah to die for the the righteous cause is is the most human thing you could do. And the thing is, is he did die for a righteous cause, not the terrorist. Yeah, not the cause, revol- but the actual righteous cause. Yeah. of reuniting those two. Or I would say like and saving Deckard. The the he died for his. Uh, I think believing in the cause is the most important thing of of the of it being righteous right like yeah that it's truly what your heart believes is the right thing yeah he didn't do it because you need to eliminate this guy because he knows too much he just he wanted that happy ending of the 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 child from his memory being reunited with their father 
whether it was him or not, that was still the righteous cause. Yeah, that yeah. was that was the the right thing to do. So, I guess we just get into this. Yeah, what worked for you? Uh, Everything. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Roger Deakin cinematography. He was the top tier I, I i tried to measure all of what i liked and figure out what i liked the most mm-hmm. and so the visual storytelling was stunning mm-hmm. um i loved how they would let scenes breathe and they would demonstrate things and they would add nuance with these really uh like stirring uh just just decisions with mm-hmm. camera work and whatnot uh, i think the overall setting and style looks amazing how they advanced it from the first Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's everything is a little more brutal, a little more dark, a little more, uh, uh, kind of dystopian. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's a little less punk, but a lot more, uh, just, just doom. Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) Just more grim. yeah. Yeah. And so, um, I really like that. I think the casting was superb. We called that out already. Mm-hmm. I think every single role was amazing, even Jared Leto. And if you don't agree, you're wrong. <laughs> um, I think that like Ryan Gosling was the right guy to play this this mm-hmm. role. He did so so well. I just couldn't even think of a weak link. I was trying to think of one, and mm-hmm. I, and I couldn't really think of one. Yeah. And just uh, the writing, the writing, mm. uh, the screenplay was so well done. How they subverted the chosen one trope. Yeah, um, that was awesome. Like <laughs> in my first watching of the movie, I was like, "Oh, he's Rachel's son." Blah blah blah. Like I was on it with him. Yeah. And then when you want it for him, yeah. And then know? when you when you learn that he's not, you're like, "What? Ugh, I'm gutted." And it was just. I love that. So, so let's. Uh, Hampton Fancher wrote the screenplay, um, the original screenplay, and that he's the writer of the original Blade Runner. Okay, that. And then Michael Green came in and and did another like a brush treatment. Up. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, that guy can write. Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm with you. So those are those are the tops for me. I guess I would say cinematography, setting, casting, and yeah. story. Okay. So. Um, ditto everything on Deacons. I wrote. I wrote a whole long thing about deacons um so we don't need to uh we don't need to rehash that um the score by uh, benjamin walfish and hans zimmer um that was really of my initial viewing the score was the thing that i kind of walked out of there like i walked out of there hearing that yeah like like just rattles you yeah and like i wasn't always like a hans zimmer devotee but over the course of this podcast I've spent a lot of time with a bunch of his scores mm-hmm. and like when I listen to Hans Zimmer scores, I see the movies in my mm-hmm. mind. Like they're so evocative and like they take me to the places um, that, you know, like the scenes from, I see my favorite scenes from those movies and they also very elegantly drop in Vangelis's score, like motifs from Vangelis's score when you when it's time to evoke moments from the original Blade Runner, yeah, the the main one being Tears in the Rain playing at the end as K dies, and it's like you hear that music when the when those first notes of Tears in the Rain start playing, you're like, oh, he's gonna die, like, because that's what that song means. That's like it's a death song, um, and you know, music has that power to. It's like a it lets you time travel, you know, like it takes you to those places, um. To piggyback a little on what you said, Ryan Gosling and Anna de Armas give really exceptional performances. So does Harrison Ford, Dave Bautista, Robin Wright, and everyone involved gives an exceptional yeah. performance. Those are just the ones I just had to call out. Um, and then Dennis Gassner's production design. Um, I you you sort of alluded to that, but I just wanted to call him out because like that the attention to detail and the models and everything oh, yeah. make the world feel real this feels like a real place you could walk into um the harder question then is what didn't work for you so i was really thinking about this and i do think it was a bit long Mm -hmm. i don't feel like there was anything that needed to be cut there were no dead scenes and there weren't there weren't things that were wasteful but i i think this could have been two two two-hour movies instead of one three-hour movie yeah yeah um i would have liked it just as much 
And I think uh, that's what I would have done. Split it. I would have split it up. I would. I, I don't know where the, I'd let Denny figure out how to do that, mm-hmm. but he could, yeah. just like with Dune. And I think uh, that's what I would have done. This was a bit much for one movie. It was overly ambitious. It was super long. And not that I didn't love every minute of it. It's just it was a lot. Yeah. It's just like a big spoonful of awesome. <laughs> so it's just I would have cut it. I would have cut it. And made it to okay. What um, you? That's all. That's your only one. That's um, it. So, just to, so Ridley Scott himself said that the the movie could have twenty minutes cut out of it, and I think that probably for the theatrical cut they should have done that. Okay. I think this should be about twenty minutes shorter theatrical, and then the home video we get this extra sumptuous two and forty minutes version of it, and and then it becomes like. Um, like the the Lord of the Rings movies, okay. right? Where everyone prefers the special editions. Sure. But for the theater, we had the we had the more palatable size. Okay. Um, I think my other criticism would be for a movie that's very interested in women's issues and racial issues, and especially how marginalized people are exploited by capitalist systems. It is not interested in their point of view at all. There's no POV female characters at all like no everyone every female in this story is basically there to serve a man um and so that especially because it's all about uh women's bodies and fertility and and like all of these things but not from a woman's point of view in the slightest um so that i think that could be a little bit better and then this is not a fair criticism at all but I think the the one two punch of K not being the chosen one, and then him dying at the end, was hard for audiences to deal mm-hmm. with. I think that's what left a lot of people feeling like bad when they left this movie, where they're like, "And he dies." So this is not a criticism. Those people don't listen to doom metal <laughs> because sad is good. Yeah. I actually think that that's a strength of the movie, yeah. that it subverts the trope and the hero dies um, heroically. Mm-hmm. I think that that is like good and brave storytelling, but I think that was a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. I can see that yeah. for sure. All right. Well, let's take a break and then we'll come back and have our final segment. Don't we normally give a final thought? Ah, rating? Shit. Well, let's <laughs> go ahead and do that. Yeah, let's do so that. Let's do the you, final thoughts and ratings. So, I mean, this is a toughie. I was I, trying to, yeah, in the interest of brevity. <laughs> in the interest of brevity, let's not rate the final cyberpunk movie. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I was I was vacillating on this one between four and five. Mm-hmm. Um, but just upon reflection and all of that, I'm just going to stick with my initial gut instinct and give it a five. I agree. It's a it's a five star film. Um, I just can't think of an, anything wrong with it that is enough to cost it a star. It's it's like being long and being difficult topics and whatnot is it's just like that's that's hard cinema. Sometimes yeah. the sometimes the easy the 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 pop culture stuff isn't exactly uh, what you want and uh, for for likes a real thinker like it's not for everyone but it is for me so i'm i'm sticking with a five i absolutely agree that it's a five um i did sort of like think about it's 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 just not it's much it's better than a four and and maybe when i look at the other 4.4 star movies it's much better yeah it the thing is i've spent since the time i like I, i watched it i think on thursday um, I've thought about it every day since Thursday. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I've continued thinking about it. I've continued pulling out little pieces of the performance and playing them back in my head. And to me, those are the things that make something a five star movie. Like sometimes a movie can be a four star movie and then you never think about it again. But it was just a good popcorn movie. It was good at movie. the moment. Yeah. yeah. But a five star movie you're still you're stewing on it days later and that's you know that's what kind of movie this is my mind is a game game mind everything's a game Uh um 
I've been actually like I've been debating. I've I watched reviews of the Blade Runner RPG, and I watched reviews of other setting agnostic cyberpunk RPGs, and I was actually debating the value of writing my own so that I could do this better. Yeah. Than I think the designers do. I mean, that's a conceit, yeah. right? But um, I think that much that it's absorbed my my brain waves like mm-hmm. it's stolen my thought space exactly um, and it's it's hard to get out so of so ultimately head. anything to me anything that's making me do that like when yeah. I'm, when i'm really ruminating on a movie like this that's what makes it a five star that's that extra sauce that makes a five star movie is that it's hitting on all those levels like, i need that blade runner 2099 that show yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, totally. I'm totally looking forward to that. Um, yeah. So, like, um, just <laughs> Guillermo del Toro says that humans exist in the real world and in the symbolic world, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, really good films hit on, on every level, right? Sure. Like, they're visually stunning. The writing is also good. The music is also good. The symbolic level of the, mo- the movie is good. And this is one of those movies. Yeah, it, yeah, it hits on on, on every, every level, every level yeah. for sure. All right, now let's go ahead and take a break. Now we'll we can do it. Come back and uh, do our closing segment. Welcome back, divers. It's time for that final segment, the one where I ask Dave, "What are you into right now?" I'm going to just say not much. Okay. So I'm Me gonna, either. I'm going to tell the viewers, uh, the viewers, the, the, the divers, what I've been. Some of them are viewing on YouTube. Yeah, that's They're true. looking at that Actually, blank screen. We've got, we've got a lot more hits on YouTube in the, mm-hmm. uh, recently. Um, I streamed a few things and I finished an audio book. So okay. um, I, I, I finished watching Wednesday. The I, I don't know if we mm. talked about this before. It's but on Netflix. Yeah, I watched yeah, it too. The, coming of age supernatural dark comedy about Wednesday Adams mm-hmm. from the uh, Adams family. Um, I really liked it. I thought it was Did you? cool. Okay. Um, it was smart. It was funny. Um, and I just, I like, I like Wednesday Adams. I like the Adams family. Mm-hmm. I like that Christina Ricci was in there mm-hmm. and, and she's a baddie. Um, spoiler. <laughs> spoiler. Oh, sorry. What this, if I hadn't watched the whole season? But this is a spoiler filled podcast. We say that. Yeah, from but not in Inception. our, not our, in our, what are you into right now? Okay. So I liked that and I finished it. Mm-hmm. I started another show after that. I'm only like two episodes in, which is the peripheral on Amazon. Okay. This is based on William Gibson's material. Oh, is that with, um, with Florence Pugh? I can't remember who's okay. who's in it, but basically it's just like a it's like a near future. It's not super far future, but it's cyberpunkish mm-hmm. where they have like a she. They do these things where they put like these the trode headset on and they're uh-huh. playing like video games and yeah. It's about this lady who's super good at it, mm-hmm. and uh, it's just pretty cool. I'm I, like I said, I'm only a little bit into it. Mm-hmm. I like how techy it is and how old crappy problems still happen you know like it's not so far future that everything uh from the modern day is unrecognizable it's not florence Pugh. it's uh chloe grace moritz i mean yeah she's really good i love her I, I remember like, she's a hit girl from kick-ass yeah she's awesome mm-hmm. i finished a audiobook in the meantime since i finished the last audiobook and, and i'm not like you where i can listen to them at work so <laughs> this is a this that's is, a lot of work yeah, yeah. um um, I finished Shadowrun Legends. Uh, oh, which okay. Is the That's f- why you were talking about Shadowrun when yeah, I got here. The first, the first book in the uh, one, you know, Shadowrun has a million novels, mm-hmm. but on Audible they have the Shadowrun Legends series, and okay. it's pretty good. It takes. I'm not going to call it a five star novel, but it was enjoyable, especially if you're a fan of the genre. Mm-hmm. It follows a character who goes from. Uh, goes from a corpo mm-hmm. all the way to a, uh, a shadow runner by the end of it. And yeah. so, it's so we should rad. explain what Sh- shadow run is a role playing game. It's a game. cyberpunk role playing game. It's a game. cyberpunk role playing game with the twist being, it's also a high magic world where there's like a, uh, there's a big magical awakening and trolls and dwarves and dragons yeah. and all this stuff come back to life after a long dormant period. So imagine you're at the end of a super high tech phase of the world's development and then it begins a new magical phase, mm-hmm. uh, 
anew. And so you're at this confluence of magic and tech. And so it's, it's kind of like, what if someone, uh, what, what if D and D uh, and cyberpunk <laughs> had a baby? Yeah. Uh, and so that's what Shadowrun is. And it's a, it's a good novel. It's fun. And, uh, I would recommend it to anyone who likes Shadowrun and has forgotten how much they like it. Okay. <laughs> you know, I had the source book and everything, but I've never actually played that game. Holy shit. We got to play it, dude. <laughs> I like Shadowrun. Yeah. I love the world, but I just never... I could see you playing an orc. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, I, <laughs> it's like, it's such a... It's one of those mashups where it feels very tailored to, to my interests. He's got like a cyber arm and yeah. a machine gun. Yeah. Yeah. Or like a... There's like Sasquatch shaman and stuff. Oh, yeah. Where it's, it's very, it's a very Pacific Northwest heavy it's game. It's based in Seattle. Yeah, so yeah. it's, it's just, uh, it always seemed like such a cool setting. Um, cool, that also, did you make any progress on the Harry Potter yeah, thing? Yeah, I, I started that too, because okay. it's podcasts, episodic, and mm-hmm. so I can watch them at bite size, like on my lunch at work and gotcha. stuff, and so okay. I'm like, I'm like six episodes in or something. Oh, and it's, it's long, so it's, it's going to be a long time. long, okay. yeah. So I'm not. I, won't, I don't expect to report back to yeah. you further into that. Okay. I call it okay so far. Okay. <laughs> that, that's not surprising. Yeah. <laughs> or that, that's about what I expect. How about you? What are you into right now? Uh, I've talked about this show before, but I just recently kind of binged through uh, season four of uh, Gretsuko, uh, hmm. which came out all the way back on December 16th of 2021. So cool thing about waiting so long to watch something is the, the new season comes out in February. So Dope. I won't have a very long gap. But who knows? Maybe I'll wait almost a year before watching that one too. Yeah. Um, so I've talked about before. This is it's a workplace comedy anime about a uh, uh, red panda named Retsuko, uh, and she works in the accounting department at a big corporation, and then she blows off steam by singing death metal. And, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I and like so it's death a metal. It's a fun. It's a fun show. It's it's like fifteen minute episodes. They're very bite sized. Uh, Ra Recho is the is the writer and director that that developed this. This season um, has been much more focused on the the lo- her love interest Haida, who's uh, played by Shingo Kato, uh, the Japanese voice, and Ben Diskin in the English voice. And he's a spotted hyena that plays bass in a punk band in his <laughs> in his downtime. Um, and it really deals with pretty heavy like social issues and generational issues in the workplace in Japan, which their generations are not exactly the the same as ours, but it, it very much is in that sort of baby boomer millennial in the workplace tension thing yeah, yeah. is what's going on. Um, but it's just because the uh, Japanese society just, there's sort of different social norms than we have. And so things are a little different than they would be here. Um, and I thought it was just like a pretty smart season of this show, which all the seasons have been about something. It's not just frivolous, like Sanrio characters. Like it's always kind of about Japanese society too, in, in amongst the kawaii of it. <laughs> um, and sometimes I like a show with 15 minute episodes so that I can like, oh, I'll watch three of these and go to bed and just jam through the, the 10 episode season real quick like that. Um, and so season five, like I said, is coming out in February, and that's going to be the the final season, and it's going to be about Retsuko running for office in Japan's parliament. Um, huh. So it's I think it's they're just kind of continuing down the line of Japanese social commentary, which I I find that fascinating. That's cool. Sounds awesome. Cool. Um, call to action. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher, as well as YouTube, Spotify, and Audible. Don't forget to leave us a review. A five-star review costs you nothing, but means everything to us. New episodes of Nick and Dave Deep Dive the Metaverse drop the 1st and 15th of every month, and you can find us on all social media platforms across the Metaverse as at Deep Dive the Meta. We're on, uh, what are the new ones? Mastodon. We... Centaur. <laughs> Not <Griffin>. Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the mythological animals. <laughs> no, it was uh, Mastodon, Hive, and Vero are our new platforms that we're nice. that we're pushing on. Well, I guess this is really goodbye. Don't say goodbye. Say good journey. 